Hello, and welcome back to all of you who joined us for the course over the past couple of days. Thanks so much for all of your engagement during our during the course. Um, if you happen to have missed it, um, all of those materials and videos are now online. The lectures are on YouTube on the ISB's YouTube channel, and all the course materials are on our, our course website. Um, but today is our symposium. Uh, and for those who, who hadn't joined us the past couple of days, um, I'm Sean Gibbons, a faculty member uh, and microbiome researcher at the Institute for Systems Biology, or ISB. ISB is a nonprofit biomedical research institute located in Seattle. We're an affiliate of the Providence Health System. We focus on some of the most pressing issues in human health, including the microbiome, of course, COVID-19, brain health, aging, cancer, and many other chronic and infectious diseases. ISB also focuses on K through 12 STEM education. Um, and as you can see this week, uh, we focus on beyond K through 12 as well, um, in particular by addressing inclusion and equity for students of color, women, and other historically underrepresented groups in science. You can learn more about ISB and our work by visiting isbscience, all one word, dot org, as you can see back here. Um, as a nonprofit research organization, we rely on the generous support of donors. Um, if you'd like to support the kind of work we've been doing this past week, um, there happens to be a link at the bottom of our website if uh, you're so inspired. Before we begin, um, I need to express our deep gratitude to the sponsors of this year's course and symposium, uh, Applied Microbiology International, Illumina, Metabolon and the Environmental Health and Microbiome Research Center at the University of Washington, also known as, known as the Embrace Center. Uh, actually, Applied Microbiology International has been generous enough to um, offer membership, one year of membership to their society for those who have registered for this year's course and symposium. Because of all their support, their financial support in particular, we've been able to offer this um, course and symposium free to, to everyone who wants to access it. Um, and, you know, this year we have a thousand people from, you know, over 80 different countries joining us. Uh, so we're, we're super pleased that to have that level of engagement from such a diverse and broad audience. Um, to all of you tuning in, we're grateful for your time today um, on social media. If you want to share your experiences about the course and about the symposium, um, you can use the hashtag uh, hash ISB micro 23. Um, we'll retweet you, for example, or repost you on X now, I guess. Um, let's see. And if you want to tag ISB, our, the handle of ISB on X now is at ISBSCI. Okay, so a little bit of information about the symposium that you're going to see today. Uh, we're really excited to present some of the leading researchers from around the world um, who are working really hard to understand the host, host pathogen microbiota interface. You know, this, the theme of this year's course and symposium has been how the, the human microbiome, the microbiota, are essentially another wing of the immune system. They act as a, a bit of a shield or a barrier against opportunistic pathogens or pathobionts. Um, so a little uh, intro to, to the various sessions and, and talks you'll be hearing today. Um, in session one, uh, so the, the structure of, of the symposium today, it's, it's a fairly short symposium. Um, it's two speakers per session, three sessions. At the end of each two speaker set of talks, there's going to be a 30 minute question and answer session. Um, the first session is entitled Commensal Pathobiont Interactions and Disease. And uh, that will be chaired by Dr. Christian Diener, who you're familiar with from the course. Uh, and our speakers today are Drs. Cecilia Naker and uh, Lisa Meyer. In the second session, uh, the topic is commensal host interactions and disease. Uh, and this will be chaired by Carl Geiser uh, with Drs. Arjun Rahman and Anna Weil as our speakers. And in the final session, we'll focus in on a particular opportunistic pathogen. Uh, the title is Clostridioides difficile. Ecological context is key. And this will be chaired by Alex Carr, who was one of our instructors in the course. Um, and the speakers will be Drs. Joseph Zacular and uh, Ophelia Venturelli. Um, so I'm super excited to hear all of these really cool talks. So like I said, um, two 30-minute talks and then a 30-minute Q&A where both speakers will be engaged by, by questions and mediated or moderated by the, by the chair. Um, if you have questions, please submit them in the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom. Um, 
We'll try to get to all the questions, depending on the volume, uh, we may or may not. Uh, but one of the functions in the Q&A is to upvote one, one another's questions. So those questions that get most upvotes from, from those who are watching are more likely to be asked during the session. So be, be uh, liberal with your, with your likes and your upvotes on other people's questions in addition to asking your own. Um, when you're asking your questions, don't forget to um, preface the question with the speaker's name so we can keep track of who's being asked what. Um, that's always sometimes, that can be sometimes hard to, uh, to infer from a question. So please try to do that. Um, if you have uh, questions um, or want to discuss with fellow uh, viewers of, of the symposium, uh, various topics, uh, you can go to our Slack channel, which uh, for those who are involved in the course, they're, they're already very familiar with, but there we, you can ask questions and, um, and, and, and interact with one another and with the TAs. Um, but if you have questions for the speakers, please restrict your questions to the Q&A within the Zoom itself. That's the only way that the questions will actually get to the speakers. Okay, um, so I think that is that for my introductory remarks. Um, we're going to have a few minutes. The uh, first session officially starts at 9.15 a.m. It's right now uh, 9.09 a.m. Seattle time or Pacific time. Uh, so in about uh, five or six minutes, um, you will see Dr. Christian Diener who will introduce the first session. Thank you and uh, looking forward to a great day.
Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first session of today's symposium. Uh, for everybody that hasn't met me yet, my name is Christian, and I'm a senior research scientist here at the ISP, and I will be sharing the first session of the symposium today. And yeah, without much ado, let's jump right into the first session of the symposium. Our first speaker will be Dr. Cecilia Neke. And Dr. Neke, please feel free to start sharing your slides while I introduce you. So Dr. Cecilia Neke is a microbiome scientist, educator, and new assistant professor in biological science at Minnesota State University in Mankato. She holds a PhD in genome sciences from the University of Washington, where she worked on bioinformatic methods for integrating microbiome omics data and modeling microbial community metabolism with Alan, Alan and Bornstein. She completed a postdoc fellowship in microbiology with Peter Turnbow at UCSF where she studied the metabolism and genome evolution of human gut actinobacteria. At MSU Mankato, her research group is interested in using experimental and computational tools to dissect the evolutionary history and metabolic lifestyles of diverse host associated microbes. So with that, let's give a huge virtual applause to Dr. Naker. And Dr. Naker, please take it away. Okay, let's see. Uh, do my slides look okay? They look great, yes. Lovely. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you so much to Sean and Christian and to everybody involved in making this event happen. I attended a previous edition of this symposium, and I feel very fortunate to be starting off this event with so many great speakers. Um, so yeah, I am a brand new faculty member at, here at Minnesota State University Mankato, and today I'm going to be mostly talking about a study uh, that I did in my postdoc research at UC San Francisco with Peter Turnbaugh. Uh, where we were trying to understand the metabolic dependencies and interactions of this particularly common and interesting uh, gut microbial species. Uh, let's see. There we go. So the, the theme of the session here today, this morning, is commensal pathobiont interactions and disease. And I thought maybe I would start with this question asking how well can we really distinguish um, which microbes are playing what role in the human gut ecosystem. So I know that we, you know, it's human nature to want to put things into boxes. And maybe as we learn about members of the microbiome, we like to organize them, maybe somewhat like this diagram I came across online, right? Um, listing examples that we typically think of as good or bad bacteria, right? Um, and so this is obviously oversimplified. Uh, you can maybe start to identify some inconsistencies here, right? So for example, there are strains of E. coli that can be probiotics and staph is actually quite often a member of the healthy skin microbiome. And uh, on the flip side, right, there are strains of lactobacillus like l inners that have been linked to poor outcomes. Um, and so on top of this, you know, furthermore, there are many microbial taxa in the human gut that we still have no idea what the nature of their host interactions might be. So as we think about this topic together today, I just want to raise this idea that maybe many microbial taxa have the potential to act as a commensal or as a beneficial mutualist even, or even also as a pathobiont, maybe depending on context, on strain variation, um, on the presence of other microbes. And so it's important for us to be thinking about that environmental context and uh, the ecology and evolution of these microbes across their environments. Um, and so, you know, I'm, I'm starting here not to get into a rabbit hole about the definitions of these terms, but just to have this ambiguity in mind as I introduce you to this particular gut microbial species that I've been thinking about for the last few years that does not fit very neatly into any of these boxes. Um, and so that species is called Agrothella lenta. It's a gram-positive member of the actinobacterial phylum, uh, or actinomycetota under the new names, I guess. And uh, I think Elenta is an interesting case study when we're thinking about uh, the beneficial or detrimental roles of human gut microbes, because first of all, it's extremely prevalent um, among healthy adult humans, especially in Europe, Asia, and the Americas, based on 
on this survey of public data that we did, we saw prevalence rates of Elenta greater than 50% in healthy adults. Um, and it seems to be particularly common in industrialized populations. So um, we've seen actually prevalence as high as uh, over 90% in some recent unpublished data uh, from the US. Um, so a lot of people have Elenta in their guts and are perfectly healthy. And so we might think of it acting as a commensal there. But on the other hand, it's also been consistently linked to disease. Uh, so my former colleague Maggie showed that it can be a contributor to the development of autoimmune disease. And it also is a relatively frequent causative agent in certain bacteremias uh, in vulnerable populations. Um, and so for those reasons, I think some people would definitely put Elenta into the category of a pathobiont or something with pathogenic potential, at least. Um, and I think this species gets even more interesting when we start to think about what its actual functional capabilities are. Um, and really, it's been, this species has been found to display a really wide variety of unusual traits. So even just the type strain of Elenta encodes 30 or 40 uh, enzymes in its genome that are sort of unusual reductases that are not really found in many other taxa. And work by the Turnbaugh lab and others have identified the substrates of these enzymes as being this array of different dietary, xenobiotic, and endogenous compounds, including some of the categories shown here. Um, and so as we think about the the consequences of those metabolic transformations by Elenta in the gut, um, uh, some of their effects might be beneficial and some of them might be detrimental. So one example here is uh, bile acid metabolism. Elenta can transform bile acids to produce this secondary bile acid 3-oxo LCA, which was shown by this group at Harvard to be uh, inhibitory to autoimmune Th17 cells. However, the Turnbaugh lab also found that the Elenta cardenolide metabolizing enzyme, so a different enzyme, different substrate, um, uh, can transform an endogenous substrate in a way that leads to activation of autoimmune linked Th17 cells. And so I think this really nicely highlights that we really need to be thinking about, again, the ecological and evolutionary context around what Elenta might be doing and whether it's having beneficial or detrimental effects in the human gut. Um, so at the beginning of my postdoc, when I was learning about what we knew about Elenta to date, it just seemed like we had these puzzle pieces that didn't fit together when you look at them from the perspective of the, the fitness of the organism. So we knew it had this specialized strain variable metabolism, but a lot of those reactions didn't seem to benefit the growth of Elenta in any clear way. Um, and we knew that it was slow growing, but also incredibly prevalent. And we also knew that it was fully asaccharolytic, meaning it does not metabolize sugars or carbohydrates at all. So this is not one of our fiber fermenting gut bacteria. Um, it instead, uh, what was known about it was that it seems to grow better when provided with a lot of this amino acid arginine. Um, so I really wanted to better put these pieces together and understand the, the full network of how to, how, uh, do these metabolic transformations enable Elenta to do all the things it needs to grow as a bacteria to obtain energy, carbon, and nitrogen to synthesize biomass and achieve this uh, slow growing yet high prevalence in the gut? Um, and so for the rest of the talk, I'm mostly going to tell you about my efforts to answer that question. And so most of this work was published earlier this year in PLOS Biology, so you can check it out there. Um, but as I said, the general goal here was we wanted to understand what were the nutrient requirements of Elenta, how does that lead to its metabolic effects on its environment, and then furthermore, to what extent are those traits predictable and understandable from the genome uh, using computational modeling. 
Um, how do those traits vary across these different strains of Elenta that we've seen can have potentially different host effects? Um, and then how does what we learn about Elenta's physiology in a lab setting uh, compare to what we actually see happening in a host associated environment? Um, so before I get into this, there was, there was first a technical problem that I had to solve, which was that Elenta is a bit difficult to grow in the lab. And previously, folks tip, typically grew it in this brain heart infusion media. And so this is, if you haven't cultured a lot of gut anaerobes, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's derived from pig and cattle byproducts. And when we analyzed BHI with untargeted metabolomics, we detected over 15,000 chemical features. And so this just makes it really difficult to tell what's going on with any individual metabolic pathway to detect very sensitively if Elenta might be producing or using something. Um, so I really needed a way to grow Elenta in a simpler, defined, minimal culture condition where we knew everything that was there and could more sensitively look at the role of individual metabolites and pathways. Um, and so the, to solve this problem, I used the tools of genome-based metabolic network modeling, which I want to introduce now and which you're already familiar with if you participated in the, in the ISB course yesterday. Um, so this is basically just this idea that we can take a bacterial genome sequence identify the genes that are present that look like they encode enzymes performing particular reactions and build that up into a network model of how all those reactions fit together. Um, so in our case, I looked at uh, initial metabolic reconstructions of Elenta and noticed that things like none of them encode any genes for tryptophan biosynthesis. So that told me, you know, any minimal media we try to grow Elenta in, we need to make sure we include tryptophan and so on. Um, and so that allowed us to design this chemically defined media where we could grow Elenta and it would grow nearly as well as it did in the traditional rich media condition. Um, and so, with that in hand, I could then go ahead and do all of this physiological profiling of this organism's metabolism. So we looked at produced and depleted compounds with untargeted metabolomics in the volcano plot here. Um, and I also did a bunch of uh, growth experiments to look at the role of individual nutrients uh, on on the growth and fitness of this organism. So um, in gray here is just growth in um, the, our regular media condition. And then the colored line indicates when each of these compounds are removed. Um, so I did so many growth experiments. This was kind of my pandemic undertaking. And uh, we found a couple things just to highlight here that arginine, appeared to be really essential for growth, which was not surprising since we thought it was pretty important previously. Um, but then we were also interested in the role of acetate and its importance for growth of Elenta. Um, and the reason for that is that acetate is a really abundant and consequential metabolite that's produced by lots of the fiber fermenting members of the gut. Um, so I was interested in following up on that and trying to understand the importance of acetate for Elenta specifically. Um, and so to do this, I was really fortunate to work with some great mass spec collaborators, Brian and Juan. And so we did this stable isotope resolved metabolomics where we fed these Elenta cultures uh, chemically labeled acetate with a 13C carbon isotopes and then looked for metabolites containing those labels um, in both uh, cell lysates and supernatants of those cultures. And we did this with acetate and we also did this with arginine to compare the roles of each of these compounds. Um, and so this is kind of a simplified map summarizing the massive amount of data that we collected in these experiments. And what we found is really that 
acetate seems to be a preferred carbon source for biosynthesis of a lot of different biomass components, including peptidoglycan, nucleic acids, and vitamins like pantothenic acid. Um, and acetate this seems to be true, even though this is an energetically expensive process to incorporate it into pyruvate and then into glucose. Um, and that's very different from what we saw with arginine here, um, which we knew was important for growth of Elenta. That was like the one thing we knew. But it was, and so we thought arginine might be a carbon source for Elenta. It's listed that way in some databases, but it doesn't really seem to be using it as a carbon source at all. It's really strictly using arginine to generate ATP and then produce ornithine as a byproduct. Um, which might have some implications for other microbes in the gut environment that can use ornithine. Um, and so I think overall, this, uh, this picture, these experiments are telling us that Elenta is filling a relatively unique niche among uh, members of the gut microbiota, where it's relying on this really common byproduct of acetate and pairing that with being able to generate energy from arginine and potentially from other pathways. And that's leading to this really varied and unusual metabolic footprint. Um, and so this starts to fill things in a little bit, but like I said, one of the things I also really wanted to explore here was the extent to which these traits could be computationally predicted and analyzed using genome-based modeling. So I just wanna share a little bit about that here. Um, and so the tool that I was using here was uh, flux balance analysis and related constraint-based methods. And so again, you might already be an expert on this if you were at the course yesterday, but uh, basically the idea here is that we can take one of these genome-based metabolic network reconstructions that I introduced earlier um, and a set of nutrient constraints, such as knowing the list of compounds that are available in our defined minimal media, and then try and infer what's the uh, optimal set of fluxes through these different reactions that are going to best, most efficiently support biomass production by this organism in this particular environment. What's the combination of reactions and at what levels? Um, so I wanted to see if we could apply this to Elenta. Um, and so when I did that, um, our first attempts really were not very successful at all. It seemed like the model really could not recapitulate a lot of what we were seeing experimentally. Um, so here you can see we used uh, the original model to look at how the growth rate uh, would be predicted to be affected by the availability of acetate here. And so you can see that computationally under this initial model, acetate had no effect on growth of the organism. Um, but after a little bit of curation and specifically removing a reaction that um, was not very confidently supported from the genome annotations, um, the curated model then reflected the experimental dependency on acetate much more clearly. Um, and uh, consistent with our experimental data, right, on the importance of acetate. Um, and so another way we looked at this was to look at growth of Elenta across a bunch of different media conditions and look at whether the conditions where the model predicted it could grow were also the ones where we observed growth experimentally. And so we saw that the model did pretty well um, at distinguishing growth from no growth, but there were also a lot of cases where the model thought that this organism would not be able to grow in that condition, but in fact, we saw that it was just fine. And so I think that gives us uh, some uh, directions to look for new discoveries, uh, potentially novel pathways or enzyme families being used by this organism that allow it to do just fine without, for example, uh, like an example of this we saw really clearly was folate. Um, the model thinks that Elenta really needs folate to be able to grow. It's an essential cofactor, but actually it does just fine without folate. And so maybe there's something interesting going on there with those pathways. Uh, so that's a direction for future research. Um, so overall, 
um, I think that gives us some of those directions to follow up on. Um, and it also gives me some confidence that these tools, which have been really primarily studied or primarily applied to really well-studied model organisms like E. coli, that we can also extend them to look at what's going on with more unusual metabolisms and more diverse bacteria like E. lenta. Um, let's see. And so one of the ways that I did want to extend this was to look at similarities and differences in the metabolism of E. lenta across strains. Um, so we know that there's a lot of strain variation in E. lenta metabolism. And so this is, uh, this big heat map here is showing the uh, 24 or so different strains that we had metabolic reconstructions for. And then every column here is showing the predicted effect of removing one of these compounds on growth of that strain. So as you can see, actually, a lot of this core metabolism was actually really similar across the different strains. And that these genes involved in this acetate and arginine usage seem to be really conserved at the species level. Um, we did identify one kind of interesting variation, which was in uh, this vitamin pantothenic acid, uh, which is a precursor of coenzyme A from the TCA cycle. Um, and so uh, this appeared to suggest that some strains could make pantothenic acid and some strains couldn't. Um, and so our follow-up experiment testing this experimentally really nicely showed that that was exactly the case, that the strains predicted to have that full pathway did just fine if you removed pantothenic acid in the light green here, whereas the ones without that full pathway um, had substantially reduced growth in that condition. Um, and so that's a nice example of using these computational tools to inform the design of experiments, because I definitely was not going to experimentally test, you know, all strains in all conditions, but this allowed us to do that in a more targeted way. Um, the other thing I want to note here about this is that um, we really only looked at this small subset of strains that had been previously isolated and sequenced um, of this organism, but it was really an arbitrary sampling, very biased, some from uh, disease subjects, from bacteremia, some from healthy people's guts, and just really very little metadata on where these strains are coming from. Um, so one of the things that I'm trying to do now is really take a much bigger and more systematic look at variation in Elenta metabolism across strains and environments in a much a more global data set of Elenta genomes to really try to understand how both these core metabolic traits and some of these secondary specialized metabolism um, have been gained and lost um, and how that variation could potentially be adaptive across different host environments. So this plot is really just a little taste of that showing what we've seen so far of the, the core and accessory genome across different functional categories, um, but hopefully I'll have a much clearer answer to this question uh, in, the, in the near future. Um, so in the last couple minutes here, I just want to transition to this last question. So I just described a bunch of in vitro physiology experiments studying this organism and computational modeling studies. Um, and I, you know, I started with this idea that environmental context might be really important. And so does any of this stuff actually help us understand what Elenta might be doing in a mammalian host, which is, which is of course, a very different environment? Um, so that's what I um, did want to make sure to look at a little bit in this study. Um, and so to do that, what we did is we did a germ-free mouse experiment where we colonized germ-free mice with one of three different strains of Elenta for two weeks um, and collected serum and intestinal contents from, 
from those mice and performed again on targeted metabolomics. And what was really cool here is that we used exactly the same uh, extraction and chromatography and other methodological parameters for the mass spec as we had done for our in vitro studies. Um, and so what this allowed us to do was that even if we didn't know the identity of a metabolite here from the mouse gut, we could look and see if we saw the same um, metabolite feature in any of our in vitro data suggesting it might be a new metabolite produced by Elenta, right? Um, and so as a first check of this, uh, I did an analysis where um, we looked at metabolites that were detected both in vitro in our minimal culture experiments and in vivo and compared if, if we see a feature that is increased in vitro, do we also see it's increased in in vivo? And of course, there's like a lot of reasons why that might not be true, right? Including effects of the host and the diet and things like that. Um, but we did actually find a lot of examples where this seems to be strikingly the case. Um, where things that are produced by Elenta that seem to be characteristic produced metabolites also show up in vivo. So that was nice to see. Um, oops. Um, but, you know, one big difference between these two environments is that there are a lot more potential nutrient substrates rather than the very limited like arginine, acetate, 12 other amino acids that we were providing in the minimal environment. In the gut, there's obviously way more nutrients available. Um, and so one interesting compound that we saw depleted by Elenta in vivo was this compound agmatine. So you can see from the plot here, that um, across our three intestinal sites, um, the abundance of this compound is generally quite a bit lower in the Elenta um, colonized mice versus the gray germ-free samples, although there is a little bit of variability, especially with the, um, oh, the blue strain here. I guess I left the legend off here. Sorry about that. Um, the this is one of our three strains. I believe it's the 15644 strain of Elenta. Um, so anyway, this is interesting because agmatine is a fairly physiologically important compound. It's involved in the host in uh, neural signaling and cell division. It's a precursor of the polyamine pathway. And the literature on this suggests that um, Mammal, mammals are, do not synthesize agmatine very efficiently de novo. And so they're thought to acquire most of their agmatine from uh, other sources, specifically the diet and also probably the microbiota. Um, and so this is sort of the flip side of that, right? Where we're seeing a microbe that seems to be depleting it out of the gut. Um, so we noticed that Elenta had some genes in its genome that looked like the enzymes in this agmatine utilization pathway that is kind of analogous to the pathway that Elenta uses to generate ATP from arginine. Um, and so I was able to uh, go back to the lab and confirm that we can actually use agmatine as an alternative energy source for Elenta. Um, it, really does uh, just as well. I think this was the first time anybody had ever grown Elenta without arginine. Like I said, we thought it was essential, but it does just fine if you give it agmatine instead here in the pink. And we also saw that the expected genes in this pathway were induced by RNA sequencing in the presence of agmatine. So that was nice to confirm what Elenta is doing with it there. So just to bring things together and wrap things up, I think these findings support this, mo this model of um, Elenta's niche in the gut as relying on acetate as a stable carbon source and combining it with maybe scavenging a wide variety of substrates from uh, sort of lower quality energy sources that aren't taken advantage of by other um, other potential competitors in the gut. And it's this combination that allows Elenta to maybe have potential beneficial and or detrimental effects. And so the other note I just wanna make here, I know I'm 
almost out of time is that I think this project really highlights the value of kind of the interplay between these different tool sets, right? Between the computational modeling, comparison across streams, and the uh, going to look at the host interactions in mouse models. Um, and so in my lab here, which is a primary undergraduate and master's institution, the niche I'm really hoping to fill is to try to extend this toolbox to more of the poorly described microbial diversity in our microbiome. So there are many other strains, many other taxa that might be having multifaceted effects like this, but nobody's looked too closely at what exactly their roles are and why that might be. Um, so I'll stop here and just really acknowledge the many uh, members of the Turnbull Lab and other collaborators who helped with this project. Um, it's a fantastic place to do a postdoc. Um, and my postdoc funding sources, and then I'll also just recognize the folks who are helping me get microbiome research off the ground here in Minnesota, Mankato as well. And so thank you so much for listening. Please do get in touch if you have questions. I look forward to the panel session. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Naker, for the uh, fascinating talk. And we'll be going right ahead with our second speaker, but just want to remind you, if you had any questions still for Dr. Naker, you can still do so in the Q&A session by like pressing the Q&A button here in Zoom, indicating that the question is directed at uh, Dr. Naker and yeah, still asking them and we will pick them up in the panel session. So our next speaker will be Dr. Meyer and Dr. Meyer will introduce you. Feel free to start sharing your slides. Uh, Dr. Maya is a biochemist and infection biologist by training. She received her PhD from the Institute of Microbiology at the ETH Zurich in 2014. During her postdoc in the laboratory of Nassos Tipas at the EMBL Heidelberg, she developed high throughput methods for the systematic investigation of drug microbiome interactions. Since 2019, she has been leading her independent research group at the University Hospital of Tübingen, where she was recently appointed to a full professorship. In her lab, she investigates whether drugs can be used to specifically modulate the human microbiome. And with that, yeah, please take it away, Dr. Meyer. Okay. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Can you hear me? Uh, In my yes. Slide? Slides are okay? Yeah, we can see it. There is like um, some slide overview at the left. Maybe when the speaker view, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So maybe I can. Maybe if you try to put them on full screen, it should show up. Okay, let me quickly try again. Better yes. now? That looks okay. great, yes. Okay, okay, sorry for this. Okay, thank you very much for the kind introduction. Um, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. Um, yeah, so I'm speaking here from Germany. So we are about to have like, we're close to seven o'clock. So if it gets darker and I have to switch on the light, please excuse me for a few seconds. Okay, so the title of my talk, Systematically Dissecting the Interactions Between Drugs and the Human Gut Microbiome. So I want to start off with a couple of introductory slides on um, the interaction between drugs and the gut microbiome in general. And then I will take it um, to what we are currently doing in the lab, some things that we already published, what we are interested in. But I want to really start with a broad introdu introduction to um, possible interactions between drugs and the human gut microbiome. I think it's exciting times at the moment because we really begin to understand that if we are about to understand differences or inter-individual differences in responses to drugs, that it's maybe not enough to just look at the host, at the human genome and how variation in the human genome influences drug responses. We are not alone, there are many additional genes and microbes that colonize us, and they actually can be part of the ex explanation why certain drugs work better in certain patients and have stronger side effects than others. So it's really the time now to not only focus on the host genome, but also look into the many of the trillion of microbial genes that are there and the strong inter -vari interpersonal variation they, they, that they bring on the table as well. And um, overall, to, to get 
to get us started, yeah, I wanted to give an introduction on possible interactions. And broadly speaking, can be subdivided into two types of interactions. On the one side, we have direct interactions that are host independent, and we have indirect interactions that are actually depending on the host. And in both cases, they can go in both directions. So drugs on the microbiome, microbes on the drugs. So I really would like to guide you through what we already know, um, explain a little bit why it's so difficult, and then also yeah, show ways how we actually can tackle these complexities. Okay, so let's get started with the direct interactions, drugs on the gut microbiome. This is something that has been shown a while ago already, that if you ask the question, what explains most of inter-individual inter variation in the gut microbiome composition, the answer is pretty clear. It's medication, the drugs that people take. And that might be pretty clear for antibiotics. Of course, if you take an antibiotic, you have a strong collateral damage on your gut microbiome. Um, that's clear antimicrobial effects. This has been known for a very long time. Can, but also can imagine that certain drugs might favor of the plume of certain species within um, the gut microbiome. So you can have compositional and functional consequences of the direct effects of drugs on the gut microbiome composition. As mentioned, very well known for the antibiotics. We have the collateral damage. We have side effects. We have associated diarrhea. I will show you in a couple of minutes that this also happens a lot for non-antibiotic drugs. And there it's a little bit more intriguing, but also quite interesting because we have first hints that it's not only an antibacterial effect, but these interactions can be part of the mode of action of the drug or it can explain side effects. Now the best or the poster boy example um, in, in the field, and that's the first drug that we realize that also non-antibiotic drugs can have an, an, an impact is actually metformin. So metformin is um, a drug that is used for type 2 diabetes. And what has been shown very early on in the field is that there is a difference in the gut microbiome composition between healthy individuals and patients that suffer from type 2 diabetes. And the conclusion was, OK, yeah, type 2 diabetes must result in a change in the microbiome composition. However, it turned out that the result was confounded because many of the patients actually took the anti-diabetic drug metformin. So metformin is a drug that you really have cramps of metformin, so really high doses of dosages in your large intestine as well. And it turns out if you have a treatment-naive type 2 diabetic person that starts treatment, that just starting treatment with metformin is enough to change the relative abundance of more than 80 bacterial taxa. So it's not an antibacterial drug, but there is a clear effect on gut commensals. So why do I think that can be part of the mode of the action um, of the drug? So what has been then shown is if you put metformin in a way so that it's just released in the large intestine, that is enough to improve glucose tolerance. So that's basically an indication that the side of action is also the intestine, because if that more of it is there, that improves kind of um, the therapeutic effect. We also know that if you take a fecal sample from a patient that has been treated with metformin and you put it in a mouse, just transferring the fecal sample is enough to improve glucose tolerance. So a, a, a yeah, sample that has been exposed to metformin without metformin being present in the mouse um, improves therapeutic effects. How this is the case, we do not actually understand. One hypothesis, one possible explanation is that the treatment reduces Bacteroides fragilis, which encodes a bile salt hydrolase that results in a higher abundance of a certain bile acid, which then antagonizes FXR signaling, which is the master regulator on the host side for glucose and lipid uh, metabolism. So here, this is an example where we have like a first idea that the interactions of drugs with the gut microbiome can be part of the mode of action of a drug. Okay. So next type of interaction, again, the direct interaction, microbes um, on drugs. And there, again, we have several possible effects. Um, first is a bioaccumulation effect. That means that the drug is just intracellularly stored within these microbes, thereby reducing bioavailability. Um, we can also have biotransformation. That means that the drug is um, modified into a metabolite that can either be an active metabolite. So then in the presence of a microbiome you would, or of microbes, you would have increased bioavailability. It can be inactivation, then you would have reduced bioavailability, or the microbes can 
um, convert it into a toxic product, then you would have basically side effects. And we have, for all of those, we have a handful of examples uh, that we know also for a longer time. So this actually happens, but we have yeah, more like anecdotal examples for, for these kind of interactions. So when we looked into what, or when, when you look into what these drug transformation actually do, it's mainly reductions in hydrolysis. This is basically explaining metabolic needs of these microbes within the intestine. So reduction basically would result in increased um, range of alternative electron ex um, acceptors for anaerobic respiration, and hydrolysis would also provide substrate, substrates for microbial growth. In most cases, we actually do not know the enzymes that are re re uh, responsible for these for these um, for these reactions. Okay, so let's move on. Let's look at the indirect interactions. So th those are all host dependent. Again, it can go in both directions: drugs, microbes, microbes on drugs. And um, the first example is here: you take a drug, and that changes host physiology. I mean, that that's the idea of a drug. It's active compounds that are supposed to do something with your body. And um, so if physiology is changed, that again can then impact the composition of the microbiome. And a good example in this context are, for example, proton pump inhibitors. They can act, they, they will increase the stomach pH. That means what can colonize the gut um, is differently. So you have a change in a microbiome composition. But also we have the other way around, depending on the gut microbiome composition, host physiology um, can be yeah, influenced. An example is here, change in gene expression, the host genes that are important for drug transport, drug, host drug metabolism, and that of course result in different efficacy of a certain drug. But you can also have direct interference uh, with enzymatic activity of certain um, um, enzymes that are responsible for drug metabolism. So an example here would be pecresol, which is a der derivative of the gut microbiome, and it um, competes with acetaminophen for um, um, sulfur transferases. So if there is high levels of pecresol, it's more difficult to convert an active acetaminophen to an inactive one, meaning it's longer active and that changes, of course, um, the efficacy of the drug. And of course, we also know that the gut microbiome trains our immune system, modulates immune processes. And if the drug's mode of action depend on your immune system, of course, the microbiome can possibly interfere with these processes. So um, good examples here are immune checkpoint inhibitors, gut T-cell therapy can also be microbiome dependent. Okay. So I think I've, I've showed you a, a few examples of interactions between drugs and microbes that we already know of. Um, that, of course, directly has implications for therapy. So, for example, you can imagine that if you already know the strain that would degrade your drug, I mean, let's just inhibit it by a co-therapy and inhibitor. Uh, if it's yeah, a certain strain, you want to target the strain, or you can yeah, inhibit a particular enzyme that is degrading your drug. Um, you can also use that as biomarkers. So if I know the enzyme for drug degradation, and if it's there, I maybe adapt those, or I directly give another I directly give another drug. So that can help um, for therapy as well. Micro, uh, another aspect is, of course, that the gut microbiome can produce drugs as well, and we can mine those. And yeah, what I'm mainly interested in is seeing whether we can also use drugs to modulate the composition of the gut microbiome towards a more healthy or beneficial composition. Okay, so now moving more to the general introduction to our specific um, research in my lab. In my lab. Um, so most of what we know between the interaction or on the interactions of, of drugs and the gut microbiome is based on large population studies, and they are awesome. Um, I think you also learned to handle um, the, the data that comes out of those in the last couple of days. So, I mean, they are, they are great, and um, I like them because they give us direct clinical relevance. We know that things are happening in humans. However, in these, in the, in the patients, yeah, all these types of interactions that I've just told you, the direct one, the in, indirect one, this direction, the other direction happened at the same time. And that's a little bit, can be a little bit confusing because you just see the outcome and you cannot disentangle. Is it direct? Is it indirect? Um, what are the enzymes and so on? So if you want to identify the causal parts, the interactions and underlying mechanism, it can be extremely helpful to go uh, to take a different approach. And this is actually what we do in my lab. 
what we do is to really take a bottom-up approach, a culture-based approach to microbiome research. So we look into drug-microbiome interactions in pure culture, In then we go stepwise um, more complex, so define communities, communities that are derived from, from human stool. Um, we have host cell readouts, but we also then um, check in knotobiotic animals and then compare to cohort studies. And this is exactly what I'm going to present in the next couple of minutes, this whole um, bottom-up approach to uh, drug microbiome interactions. Now, we know now that many of these microbes are anaerobic bacteria, and we have many, many different um, species in our intestines, and we have a lot of drugs on the market. So this is just possible if we have high throughput assays and we put, have these high throughput F assays by putting robo robotics inside anaerobic chambers so that we have scalable and automatable assays. And we have different assays running now in the lab. Most of the time, we just look in bacterial growth. So we have growth assays. Um, can also be more complicated relative abundances, of course, if we look into a community setup. Um, yeah. Yeah, so... To, towards a little bit more introducing my own research question. So I've showed you for this drug microbiome interaction, um, this anecdotal examples for these interactions for few drugs that we knew of. But what I really wanted to have when I started off as a postdoc at EMBL in Heidelberg in Nassus Tupper's lab was a systematic overview on a systematic map on all possible interactions that can take place. I um, wanted to know whether these effects are direct, are they depending on just one microbe, is this an effect that just emerges in a community? Is this an effect host dependent? And what are the underlying molecular players? Um, again, we have both directions. So drug degradation, bioaccumulation, transformation. It's not the main focus of my work. Um, however, still, I want to um, yeah, emphasize that this has been done now as well. So here we also have systematic or more systematic maps now. And the current estimates are that two thirds of the drugs are actually metabolized microbially. We will have to see what's the consequences um, for the host. But yeah, I mean, it, it is not this few examples that I just introduced, but it's really many. It's it's rather, it's the rule and not, not the exception. Now I'm more interested in, in the direct effects in terms of growth. Um, of a variety of different drugs. So this is now the topic for the next couple of slides. Okay, when I started off my postdoc, I wanted to have the systematic map. So we started off selecting 40 species of the healthy human gut microbiome. They cover quite um, a high percent percentage of the genera that are present in the healthy human gut microbiome. And then I did a screen of 1,200 FDA-approved drugs and that selection had both antibiotics and human-targeted drugs. I guess you can imagine this is some... so in the beginning we just did as one at one concentration, which on average we feel these drugs would reach in a large which reach in a large intestine. So um yeah, I mean that's one concentration so far. And we did this in our high throughput setting um inside an anaerobic chamber. Okay, and this is now summarizing years of work basically in one slide. So from, from the drugs that we have tested, yeah, we had some 144 antibiotics and 77% of them inhibited at least one strain from our selection. But what you can see in the color bar here, in many cases, we had all of the 40 strains inhibited. So antibiotics have a broad impact on gut microbiomes. So that is, is, is nice. And in the beginning, I thought, okay, the control works, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy. But I will tell you a little bit more um, later on also about the antibiotics. We also found that not only metformin, so metformin was the motivation for us to get started, yeah, because that was such a, wow, non-antibiotic drugs can inhibit gut commensals. What is this a broader effect? So that was the motivation. But in the end, um, what we found is that from more than 800 drugs that we have tested, um, more than 200 inhibited at least one strain from our selection. So this is rather common that you have a side effect of a drug on the gut microbiome or members of the gut microbiome. And what you can nicely see here is that the effect is not as broad. So in many cases, it's just 10 or less strains from out of the 40 that we have tested that were actually inhibited. We did then a lot of work to convince ourselves that this is reflected in humans. I mean, in the end, it was a test tube in, in, in the monoculture. And we compared to uh, data that was available from cohort studies, we find quite high concordance. And we also did a lot of work, and I have no time to show this today, but 
the effect seems also be reflected in side effect patterns. So just from the side effect pattern of a drug, we can actually predict whether we would also expect antimicrobial activity against the panel of microbes that we have tested. Um, so if you look into the different therapeutic classes, we find effect across all therapeutic classes. However, they are particularly enriched for the antipsychotics and for the antimetabolites. Um, for the antipsychotics, I think this is quite surprising. Yeah, I mean, the transporters and the receptors they are supposed to target in humans are not necessarily known to be there in bacteria. Um, however, there is a lot of signaling going on, on along the gut brain axis. So this could be some drugs where you can also imagine it's part of the mode of action to also, you know, act on the gut microbiome. Um, for the antimetabolites, it makes more sense. It's conserved pathways between pro and eukaryotic cells and uh, targeting those, of course, would then also have an effect on, on gut bacteria. Okay, so something what we also observed very early on is an interesting, um, an interesting correlation and that's basically shown here. So for so each point basically is a species and on the x axis you have the number of antibacterial drugs that would inhibit a species. And on the y axis you have the number of non-antibiotic drugs that would inhibit a species. And overall there's quite positive correlation, meaning species that are more sensitive to antibiotics are more sensitive to human targeted drugs. And we wanted to test this. So what we did is we took an E. coli strain. So E. coli is down here. And we reasoned that if we knock out an antibiotic resistant mechanism, the strain should not only be more sensitive to antibiotics, but also um, to human targeted drugs. And this is exactly what happens when we knock out TOL-C, which is an antibiotic efflux pump. Um, the strain then is also more sensitive to human targeted drugs. We find this also in other species here, uniform, uh, Bacteroides uniformis. In isolate, it's more resistant to antibiotics, also more resistant to human targeted drugs. Okay, then we wanted to know, you know, how does this work? Can we do this more globally? So what we did here is we took E. coli and um, we had an overexpression library. So basically we ex overexpressed each individual gene of the genome of E. coli and asked the questions, which gene do we have to overexpress to rescue E. coli growth in the presence of the human targeted drug? And um, the results, so this is the human targeted drugs that we have tested, and the result is basically um, yeah, here. So everything that is boxed here is antibiotic resistant genes. So if you overexpress an antibiotic resistant gene, E. coli will also become more resistant to antibiotics, uh, to non-antibiotics. And um, so there's a cross-resistance of antibiotics and, and human targeted drugs, which is kind of scary because that's, that implies that there might be a risk of acquiring anti-resistances by consuming non-antibiotic drugs. And by now there are some cohort studies that also has um, have, have similar results. So that's actually seem to happen in patients as well. So summary so far, I, I've showed you that there is an I I intensive impact of drugs on um, gut microbes, a direct growth effect. And it's not only, an only antibiotics, but also non-antibiotic drugs. This is relevant in vivo. We see this in a side effect pattern. Um, certain therapeutic classes um, consistently affect gut mics. So several members of the drug class affect gut microbes. And we find that antibiotic resistant mechanisms can also protect against uh, human targeted drugs. Okay. Now that was um, published in 2018. And we went ahead and actually looked a little bit closer in the antibiotics. So this is the second part. It's also a part of my postdoc work together with Camille Goemans and Nassus Tippers lab. So for the antibiotics, I mean, we know that there is a strong collateral damage uh, on our gut microbiome. This has long been known. It's more appreciated. So in the recent past, um, long-term microbial uh, changes in the microbiome composition can then result in a development of allergic, metabolic, immunological, inflammatory diseases. However, we, we did not have, and I was surprised by myself, yeah, we did not have a direct interaction map. So which antibiotic would inhibit which gut commensals? For the pathogens, I mean, this is very well documented, but it was not so clear for the commensals. And we already had in hand uh, the effects of 40, uh, 144 antibiotics from different antibiotic classes on 40 species. and um, 
at this concentration of 20 micromolar and we did like a follow-up. So really concentration resolved minimal inhibitory concentrations that we've tested. Both data set are in quite good concordance, uh, but of course we can way, learn way more from the concentration resolved data set. And that expanded the available MICs for commensals by 80% what was known from, from commonly available databases. Um, what can we learn from the data? So um, this is just counting the number of inhibiting strains by certain antibiotic classes. And I think you can appreciate that there are class-dependent effects. So aminoglycosides do not do very much. Yeah, they, This is known under anaerobic conditions. So aminoglycosides need to be actively imported, which is which requires energy, energy levels low in an anaerobic conditions. So this was expected. Then we find here fluoroquinolones. Fluoroquinolones are all over the place. However, if you take a closer look, you actually can see that this is generation dependent and newer variants, so newer generation having a stronger impact on gut commensals. Again, that makes sense because the idea was we want to have a broader spectrum so that they are not only inhibiting gram positive or gram negative, but both. And that has then as a consequence, a broader collateral damage on gut um, commensals. Okay, and then for better lactams, again, all over the place, we followed up on 19 bacteroides and eight better lactam antibiotics. So what you basically can take home from here is that the resistant profile does not at all recapitulate phylogeny, um, meaning this is really a strain-specific trait. Um, yeah, then macrolides and tetracyclines would just inhibit all of the members that we have tested. Now, that was surprising to us because we um, basically thought, yeah, um, macrolides and tetracyclines are those class where we actually would expect, um, where we were actually were quite quite surprised. Um, so, so again, for the for the for the better lactams, maybe I start with better lactams. Yeah, they are bactericidal antibiotics. We know it's a strain specific trait. So, what makes sense is if you inhibit individual members of the gut microbiome, of course, you have an overall big shift. Now, macrolides and tetracyclines, we know from, from, from patient data yeah, that they have a strong impact on the gut microbiome con composition. However, they are textbook bacteriostatic antibiotics. So that means um, they are just uh, supposed to inhibit, but not necessarily to kill bacteria. However, um, if, you, if you just inhibit, but not kill, yeah, and then you inhibit all of them, how can this change the overall composition? And that that is something we looked into. So for a handful of different gut microbes, we actually checked the percentage of survival cells after five hours of exposure. And what you can nicely see here is that in many cases, we have a drop below a threshold of 0.1%, which is a clear bactericidal activity. So although in from pathogens, they are more bacteriostatic antibiotics, they had uh, bactericidal activity on commensals, which you can nicely see. If you look into the mic microscope, you see all sort of shape defects, but also you see lysis here in the cross curve. And uh, we think that this differential bactericidal activity in the end is the reason for the large effects uh, on the microbiome composition. And this is important in the community context. Um, so this is here for E. coli. Here, one E. coli is really it's a bactericidal activity, it's a bacteriostatic activity, which is also true in the community context. Now, if we treat and we do a washout and treat again, in this case where we have a bactericidal activity, you really lose the E. coli from the community, meaning this is important in the community context where there is strong competition. So you will just get out diluted. Okay, and for the last couple of minutes, I would like to show you another thing that we can nicely do with our setup. And that is, um, yeah, find ways to circumvent um, to circumvent antibiotic um, the collateral da damage of antibiotics on on gut commensals. So at the time where we started this part of the study, there was another postdoc in the lab that could show that drug drug interactions are very species specific in bacteria, and then we thought we can use the species specificity. <laughs> to selectively protect commensals from antibiotics, but the antibiotics should still work on pathogens. So we thought we could find just by screening compounds that would selectively antagonize the effects of antibiotics on commensals. So we tested many, many compounds in our screening setup to find such antidotes that would protect commensals. To put a long story short, we found several ones and I would like to show or tell you a little bit more about two of them, which is Dicumarone and Benzpromarone. So what we do, the assays that we do, we do this checkerboard assay. So here's Bacteroides vulgatus. This is the area under the growth curve. 
Um, orange means perfect growth at a certain concentration of erythromycin. The bug cannot grow anymore. However, you can rescue growth if you add benzpromarone and dicomarol. Um, you can also rescue the percentage of surviving cells within the community. And that not only works for bacteroides, but for a bunch of different other bacteroides as, as well. However, it does not work on a pathogen. So Staph aureus, um, Ificalis, um, Ifetium, they are just not inhibited. So this is exactly what we were looking for. We also tested this in a community setting. So when we add kind of this antidote, um, we can, so this is basically the normal composition. This is the erythromycin treated. However, if we add the antidote, we have a composition that very well resembles the um, untreated community. So we can rescue uh, or we can prevent the collateral damage. We can also do the same in a community where we just spiked in the pathogen. Um, this is basically showing that the community cannot grow any longer. The community can grow in the presence of the antidote. However, we cannot detect any Enterococcus fecalis in those communities any longer. It also works in stool samples. So what we did here, we had a stool from the patient treated um, in vitro with erythromycin. And um, the size of the circle basically indicates the number of or the number of OTUs that were sensitive to erythromycin which you can see in all the nine individuals that we've tested, um, most of them had reduced OTUs for bacteroidals, glostriales, and others. Those individuals just had resistant bacteroidals, so that happens also. And then, of course, in this case, you cannot protect them because they're already protected. Now, if we basically add um, dicumarol, and this is now the shade, basically, um, um, of these circles, you can see in all cases that we were able to rescue bacteroidals. Overall, we could rescue more than 50% of the bacteroidals, and in many cases, it was bacteroides. So this is exactly what we screened for. We could rescue bacteroides within these communities. Ultimately, we did the animal experiment. So we had mice that were colonized um, with a defined community. There was our bacteroides vulgatus in there. We, if you treat with erythromycin, there is a decrease um, or drop in Bacteroides vulgatus level, and then there is basically rescue if you remove like the drug. However, if you have a co-treatment with the antidote, this drop is less dramatic. So there is really a protection of bacteroides um, also in, in, in the mice. So this is shown here for dicomarol, but we find similar effects also for benzpromarone. So it's also um, possible in an in vivo setup. So to sum up, I think in the second part, I showed you a high resolution map of antibiotic effects on gut microbes. We are now interested more in the strain level pattern because we know in particular for the better lactams that this matters. I've showed that macrolide and tetracyclines act bactericidal on gut microbes. This is just very few um, words left. I'm done in a second. Um, so the consequence on the decline on microbiome diversity is basically what we are interested in. Um, I showed you the antidotes as a concept to selectively protect gut microbes under antibiotic treatment. Here we are curious about the underlying mechanism and whether we can use those antidotes also for other microbiome-related diseases. And with this, I would like to thank my, my group here in Tübingen, um, a lot of collaboration partners, our funding. Thank you for your attention. And I hope I could have showed you that you can also take uh, approaches to the microbiome field that it's not necessarily based on metagenomic sequencing. And yeah, I'm also looking forward to hear about your questions in, in the panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dr. Meyer, for another great talk. Yeah, we'll be transitioning to our panel session now, um, where we'll be asking the questions that were asked in the chat. Um, thanks so much for both speakers joining us here again. Um, fascinating talks. Uh, we'll start with a question for Dr. Neke. Um, so, and our most upvoted question there was that curation was really important for your e lenter model. How do you feel about these large databases of partially curated models like Agora, for example, but there's many others. Are there efficient ways to improve cur curation in those databases and high throughput? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. And I think, uh, fortunately, a lot of people are really working on this. So I think we're gonna see some really cool advancements in the next few years. Um, Agora, I mean, Agora does have a framework for incorporating experimental growth data where available, but in this 
case, part of the part of the challenge was that there was literature that suggested Elenta should be able to do this reaction, maybe, but it was it seems to be not true. Um, so it was almost like incorrect curation previously that we had to undo. Um, and so I think I think some of these uh, folks working on like really high throughput growth assays with robotics uh, in the anaerobic chamber to really test many microbes, many conditions will be really valuable because um, the other concern is not just curation, but sort of uneven curation, right? Like when we're thinking about models where the, especially in a community context, like we're way better at predicting what E. coli is going to do than what anything else is going to do. So I think incorporating like high throughput experimental assays uh, more cohesively, more comprehensively into these models is going to be really valuable. Um, and the challenge is just making sure for these bacteria that are difficult, difficult to grow, difficult to test in many conditions like Elenta, making sure that uh, those sorts of curation pipelines don't just like leave them out, but instead try to um, actually identify what might be happening with those organisms. Yep, thanks so much. Yeah, our next question is for Dr. Meyer. It's from Alyssa. Uh, have you also looked at indirect effects of medication mediated by other body systems? Um, for instance, drug via the immune system and then coming to the microbes, so maybe non-metabolic interactions. But what might be the strengths of these effects be compared to direct effects? Um, yeah, I mean, that, that's a brilliant question. And in the end, apart from the direct effects, the indirect are equally important to look at, but a little bit more complicated because there you need not only, you know, a bacterial culture and your, and your drug, but you need a host system, be it like a host cell, be it um, organoid, be it a mouse, um, also your know, patient data. And this is something we are about to dive into, but have not systematically done so far it's way complicated so this is why this is not our first choice but we we are about to do that as well um also to to really disentangle what are the direct what are the indirect effect because in the end we now have the tools yeah we can look into what's the direct effect in vitro what's the direct effect on an in vitro community and if you have mice that are colonized with the same in vitro community you can then basically disentangle what are direct effects that only emerge in an in vitro community and then only emerge in a mouse. And then you can then study what's the process of the host site that are involved. But that is for each individual drug really like a long process. And um, we are just now about to look at the direct effects in the mice. And the next step will be then look a little bit more on, on the host side, step by step. But yeah, that's a good suggestion and we are on it, but that will still take and we have to reduce the number of drugs that we can look into. But yeah, in clinics, this, this has been shown. Yeah, I mean, for, for certain drugs, we know that um, the microbiome can be predictive of, of treatment outcome. And um, so there is something to more better understand. Yeah, and some things, for example, in, in, in certain cancer therapies, yeah, we already know a little bit more, but yeah. More work to come, and I can just adver advertise the field. This is, is absolutely fascinating. So more people working on it, the better. Thank you. Yeah. Um, next question is for Dr. Naker. Um, have you explored interactions between ELENT and other gut commensals? Do you know to what extent it engages in competitive or cooperative interactions with other commensals? Maybe to piggyback on that, because I had like very similar question is also like, yeah, since it had ELENT had that many oxocrophies for certain amino acids, like do you think those are usually supplied by other gut commensals to ELENT? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, so Short answer, we have started working on this and it's just been, you know, uh, between a project that's been between different people and uh, hasn't quite gotten fully followed up on in terms of looking at interactions of Elenta with other um, commensals. So I would say on that, we have some preliminary data. It's interesting, but maybe stay, stay tuned on that one. Um, it does seem to be interacting in a variety of ways with um, other, other members of the gut microbiome. Um, 
And then in terms of the oxytrophies, yeah, this is something I find really interesting. Um, so some of them, right, could be, could be dietary. Like I think we definitely expect protein from the diet to be reaching uh, the colon to some extent, right? So I think some of that is being sourced from the diet or the host. Um, it's definitely possible. Some of it could be coming from other organisms. Uh, things like things like tryptophan, I think, is interesting because tryptophan is pretty expensive to biosynthesize, and so I don't think there's a lot of examples of other microbes like secreting excess tryptophan for the tryptophan oxytrophs to consume, right? Um, but but that's not something that I've looked at specifically. I think it's definitely something interesting to think about and. Um, worth further research to pin down, you know, which of those sources are most important, um, host versus diet versus other microbes, right? Yep, thank you. Yeah, next question is for Dr. Maya again. It's from Jashwita, and they are asking, many microbes are not culturable. You mentioned that you mostly use culture-based methods in drug tasting. Um, you know, how well does that work or how representative might that be for those non-cultural organisms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I, I think I still it's still in many many textbooks, but we are good now in culturing, in culturing. So we we are getting pretty good in also you know having personalized collection for individual members. So I mean it's really rapid how basically um, culturability. Um, is not so much an issue anymore, like just to get them to grow. It's a little bit more tricky if you want to have like minimal medium there, I definitely agree. But in our medium, so what we do in our essays, we want to have them, you know, we want to make them perfectly growing so that we can even see slight inhibitions. And many of them we can actually now grow. I mean, there are still some that we can't, but um, I, I think this is create plate anatomy where said, yeah, okay, most of the things you cannot culture, I think that's maybe not the opinion of the experts any longer. So we are pretty good now. Perfect, thanks. Yeah, next question again for Dr. Neke. Um, when comparing metabolite associated with Elenta, both in vivo and in vitro, did you try looking at serum metabolites for the in vivo compartment as well? Yeah. We did, and this is in the paper, um, so you can go check it out there. But um, we did not see a lot of signal from the serum metabolites. Um, and so that is different from what's been seen from these germ-free monocolonization experiments with other gut microbes like Clostridia, where they've seen lots of secreted or lots of metabolites that are produced by the microbes and absorbed into circulation. And we did not see very much of that with Elenta, which I think is interesting. And I don't really have any good hypotheses on why it might be, but it does seem like the, the and this is from a couple of different experiments, um, that the metabolic effects of Elenta seem to be primarily like localized to the intestine. Um, so we did look at that and we didn't see a lot. Thank you. And then um, there are two questions for Dr. Meyer that are both somewhat related to the rescue treatment or the antidote treatment. So I will kind of combine them. So one question was, have you thought about testing whether or not the antibiotic protective treatment preserves the capacity of the microbiota to prevent passive biont invasion, for instance, C. diff? And then another question was just about clarifying um, the mechanism that the antidote benzobromarone is saving commences dialectically over pathogenic bacteria. Okay, so these are perfect questions to be asking one question. So, <laughs> like for for historical reason, yeah, I mean the antidotes, those are drugs because we just you know we wanted to screen everything. That's the concept work. We just screened everything that we had in our freezers, and because we're studying drugs, I mean th these were drugs. So th the idea of giving a drug to protect your gut microbiome and the drug has an effect on the host because it is a drug, a bioactive compound, it is wrong in a way because we don't want to have an effect on the host, which is for the comarole, like um, anticoagulant. So this is not something feasible in, 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 in clinics. It's for, for, for us, it was a proof of concept. 
And the idea for the next step actually was to figure out what is the mechanism, because if we have figured out the mechanism, we can trigger that process by something that is not necessarily, does not necessarily have an effect on, on the host. So this is why we need to find out the mechanism. And this is actually something that we are currently um, doing. We have several ideas. Yeah. I mean, one possibility could be that um, there is like uh, any kind of process that would just reduce the intracellular concentration of the antibiotic inside um, the the commensals, but not in the pathogens, so that there is something like we have just a reduced um, um, concentration. So this is something that we are following up. We are also looking into what actually triggers this response. Yeah, and we have now also isolated resistant strains that are actually cannot be protected. For certain reason, that's super helpful for us because it helps us to narrow down a possible mechanism. Um, but also one possible way that or one way that we are also going is we look into, we do not even know what these antidotes bind to in a cell. Yeah. So better understanding what's the process they are triggering. So finding the binding partner in the cell is another strategy that we are following up. And I hope at some point I <laughs> can report and we find alternative ways. And as soon as we have those, I mean, we are happy to, to see whether this would also then protect uh, from invasion with, with pathogens and so on. But at the moment, because it is a concept that is not usable in clinics, um, we, we also don't, we first look for compound. We also used all derivative for decomarol that we can get to see whether we have a non-active compound that would trigger the process, um, which was not so successful so far. So we are on it. Perfect, thanks, that's great to hear. Yeah, um, and another question for Dr. Neko was, if Pretty short one by Joe Lim, and he's asking, do you know of any other microbes with a similar niche, or is it kind of unique to Elenda? Yeah, I mean, I think this particular combination is definitely unique. So some of these um, more specialized transformations are definitely unique, um, but there are other organisms that have individual pieces of the whole strategy, right? So there are other organisms like the sulfate reducers that also use acetate as a carbon source, for example. Um, and there are, um, you know, like Enterococcus also has the same arginine catabolism pathway, which I think we might hear about uh, later from Dr. Zakular. Um, and uh, so, so I guess like, there, there are pieces of this that are shared among other taxa, but I think the combination is pretty unique. And the other thing I would say is, so Elenta is a member of this family, Agarthalaceae, and that family seems to be basically universal across mammalian gut microbiota, like you see it in basically every data set, but um, we know even less about the metabolic niche of some of the other members of that family than we do about Elenta. So it may be that they're filling a similar role, but that hasn't quite been really fully pieced together yet. Perfect. And thanks. Maybe to switch it up a little bit, I will add in one question for both speakers. Um, just as a very broad one, we heard a little bit about context and environment and like following up on that, like how much do you think of what you have been seeing in your work um, is also expandable on a global level um, because microbiomes can vary quite a lot and we mostly study them in affluent populations for now. Um, do you think that some of those behaviors might actually look different if we look, for instance, in undersampled populations or just in general microbiomes we haven't looked at in specific like um, compositions up to now? Like for instance, could Elenta take at different niches or might drug effects be actually be different um, across various populations? Who goes first? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, it, it depends a little on on the effect. So I, I think it's pretty sh safe to say that antibiotic effect will be strong across um, different populations. However, still, I mean, we see for certain drugs strain dependent effects. So that is something um, where, where I can see that that, that this is context dependent. And um, where we can also see inter-individual differences. In particular, I think for drug degradation, that will be important. For me, it's more like the other way around. Yeah, when I look into complex microbiomes, let's say from hunter-gatherer and so on, and I now see less complex microbiomes, 
then for me, you know, this is linked to industrialization. This is linked to a higher drug usage. So this is for me the link that I see like more in evolutionary history that we now take all these drugs and that might be part of the reason why we now have a reduced complexity in the microbiome. Yeah, it's uh, it's a hard question, and I think you know by by definition we don't we don't know the answer in populations we haven't looked at yet, right? Um, and, but and I think for Elenta, it's particularly interesting because Elenta really seems to be much more common in industrialized populations than in more isolated populations in the studies that have been done to date. Um, and so I don't think we really know anything about like the basis for that. But I do think it's very likely that there are some more of these, you know, poorly characterized gene families that are performing novel, unusual metabolic transformations of substrates that, you know, we've only scratched the surface of what Elenta is doing, but there must be so many more of these interesting chemical reactions going on in other populations um, that just haven't been discovered yet. And like I said, I think, um, you know, we tend to see some of these other Agrothalaceae species in populations outside of urban industrialized areas. And I think they're probably doing some really interesting things biologically that we uh, haven't, haven't even scratched the surface of yet. So uh, I guess, I guess I'd say, I don't know, but I hope we find out. Perfect. Yeah, thanks. Those were great replies. Um, yeah, we have another question for Dr. Meyer by David Fredericks. Um, they are asking, were all antibiotic resistant genes associated with resistance to human targeted drugs or just F efflux pumps? I mean, e efflux pump makes maybe most sense. Like you pump things out and it's good that then you also pump um non-antibiotics out but you know it, it's more than that some of them need to be induced and they are also induced by the non-antibiotic drugs um, there is also more to that that we have other um, in, in in the in the E. coli overexpression libraries we have also other um, resistant classes that basically pop up um, so that seems to be more universal than just on on the pumps but the pumps obviously that that's easiest to understand What's the underlying uh, reason? Does that answer the question? I hope this answers the question. Yeah, I think it does. Yeah. Um, next question for Dr. Nika from Itisham, and they are asking um, Can you shed some light on the role of Elenta metabolites on the pathophysiology of autoimmune diseases? Or are there like any effects of those metabolites directly on the host? Yeah. Um, so there's a couple big studies on that that I am not directly involved in, but that are published, you can check them out. Um, and they are from the Turnbull lab from Maggie Alexander in Cell Host and Microbe. And that was really looking at the role of this cardenolide metabolizing enzyme in Elenta in autoimmune pathogenesis. Um, and then uh, Sloan Devlin and Jun Hu at Harvard have done some work on Elenta bile acid metabolism in autoimmunity, and they have a couple papers on that. And then there's also some work looking at it in multiple sclerosis. So there's lots of folks who are exploring that. And so I would really just refer you to the literature on that, I think, because um, I'm definitely not an immunologist. So I'm probably not actually the best person to answer that question. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, and then we have two questions for Dr. Meyer from Ken, which I will combine because they're somewhat related to the regulatory part and the market. First question is, do you think that microbiome testing um, should be done in general in the drug approval process now, given based on your results? And then also, um, given that so many drugs appear to have effect shifted by the microbiome, might it actually make sense to rather treat the microbiome than giving certain drugs? Okay, uh, one by one. So question number one. Um, so, I mean, I, we report a strong impact of many drugs on, 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 on gut microbes. Yeah, and that, that's, you know, getting started. Yeah, so if, if this would need to be included in the, in, the, in, the, in the process, then only if it, there is a severe consequence on, on the host. Yeah, because in the end, I don't know, at least in Germany, yeah, people get quite scared if they have to take antibiotics and 
you know, I, I even get people calling me, can I use decumarol to protect my gut microbiome? And I, I think, you know, you, you have a disease, you have to, this has to be treated and you have to take the side effects. Now, if we can reduce them, if we put this in drug developing um, pipelines, you know, to help, like to improve a drug, I think can be can be important. But there, you really need to know is there a strong side effect so that it's basically worse. And then I'm also still feel that we are a little early in terms of you know what would be an appropriate testing. Yeah, would it be fine to test the type strains as we did? Wouldn't we miss a lot? So would we just need to test you know fecal samples from 100 representative from, from a certain population? So for me, I, I could not even answer on what I would then consider appropriate testing. So I think we should think along these lines, but I think for certain things, we first have to see what's actually the consequences and what would be appropriate tests that we can ask that are needed and that can be standardized. And I think there we are maybe not there yet, but this is definitely something to consider in the future. And the second question was whether... Uh -huh. We might like consider treating the microbiome instead of giving certain drugs, since a lot of the mode of action might be modulated by the microbiome. Yeah, I mean, this is, <laughs> I mean, in general, yeah, eat healthy <laughs> to prevent <laughs> certain diseases. Yeah, I think this concept is already there. We have the prebiotics, the prebiotics, the probiotics, and so on. The psycho psychotropics, I think they are um, like in, 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 um, um, the idea to to basically treat psychological diseases with um, prebiotic strains. So this is all ideas that that are out there, and I think we are about to explore how this is best feasible. But in the end, I mean, it all comes down with we now have this first map for what we should follow up on. But in the end, we we need to have the proof that this is this is tr true for a certain for a certain drug. Yeah, that we can actually say, okay, a patient. When a certain gene is there, it actually has an impact on, on treatment. And remember all what I've showed you so far was done either in, in a test tube or in mice. So that's all preclinical pre at the moment. And I think we're on a good way because in the end, there is potential to improve current therapy. However, that's still some steps to do. Thanks. Yeah. And another question for Dr. Neka, and I promise that it's not a question from me. Um, have you tried <laughs> integrating Elenta into a community scale metabolic model of the human gut to explore interactions across microbiota contexts in silicon? You know, I, I did. That was like a whole section of a proposal I wrote, but we have not really done it yet well. Um, it's, I mean, it sort of goes with that community interactions project where I it's preliminary, and that's definitely a thing I would like to do. Um, and so I, I hope I can say yes, um, you know, in the next year or two. But I don't, I have not yet gotten that off the ground. Um, so uh, hopefully we'll we'll get to that soon because I, I agree it's a great it's a great idea. And I think the folks who are working on these methods and tools, like Christian for community modeling, uh, will be eager eager users of them for sure. So. Thanks. Uh, and another question for Dr. Meyer. Um, the antipsychotic result is fascinating. Based on this, can you speculate on how important the microbiota might be in host endocrine neurotransmitter signaling? I mean, so I, yeah, I mean, there's clearly signaling going on between the gut microbiome, the gut brain axis. Um, what's the role of the antipsychotics? I actually we can speculate. The interesting thing that we found is that independent of the chemical structure of the antipsychotics, we actually find that always the same subset of species were targeted. And that we found interesting because it's always the same subset of species independent of, of the chemical structure that all have the same result on the host. You can basically speculate that you know, targeting the subset is part of the mode of action because all these drugs actually do that. Um, we are now in the process of figuring out, yeah, what's so special about that subset, and is this somehow involved in drug in in gut brain signaling? But I mean, this is really we are we are at the beginning, and um, yeah, maybe another word that I have to say. So we did the screen of this one thousand two hundred compounds. That's all FDA approved drugs, and that are out of patent. And many of the newer antidepressants, for example, were just not represented in that library that we've tested just because 
yeah, they are still under patent. Um, so this is something that we are now also following up to see also not only for the antipsychotic, but also the antidepressant, whether we see similar effects. And yeah, I think there's, uh, this is a baby steps, but something I'm also super cu curious about. Thanks. And yeah, I think we can, those will be the last pair of questions. So, <laughs> so that you can also relax a little bit after that. Um, there's one more question for Dr. Nake. I will rephrase that a little bit. I think um, the question aims at um, asking if you could maybe use the compositional differences you showed with Elente to, you know, um, as also associated, I mean, you showed that there are specific difference in disease phenotypes. So do you think like, you know, Elenta or specifically maybe Elenta using a specific niche could be used to kind of explain um, why those differences are there, or why those diseases arise, or do you think it's more like coincidental maybe? Um, that's, that's interesting. Um, I, so I think, I think one way that like the, the models and this sort of like reductive analysis of the, the niche of an, of an organism can help us is to help narrow down the, the possible reasons why we see a particular association in like a population study. So I think, I think if that's what the question is asking, I think that's, the answer is yes. Like the models can help us assess, do we think that's happening because there are changes in the nutritional environment in like, you know, a person with an autoimmune disease that support the growth of Elenta, for example, or does it increase abundance of uh, some other organism in the gut, um, you know, provide some beneficial cross-feeding relationship that impacts the abundance of Elenta. So I think, I think the, the models and uh, sort of accompanying in vitro experiments can help us like differentiate between those different possible hypotheses to explain those associations that we might see from metagenomic studies. Um, that's definitely kind of uh, one of the use cases for sure. Perfect. Thanks so much. And the last question will be for Dr. Meyer. It's by Fernando Nieto, uh, who says, a uh, great talk. How would you validate your bottom-up approach in terms of actual effects at the organismal level, considering, well, yeah, conquistan taxa might not be culturable. I think you commented on that, but like, yeah, maybe like answering the questions how one could validate that in vivo. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it is, of course, how to say, yeah, so I, I mentioned also before that in the end, what we did is we we did we use type strains. Yeah, it's the question: how representative are they for any species? And of course, what then is true in a community and so on. I think it's an awesome approach to get first insights to what to expect. Yeah, what is the direct effect? What is the community mediated effect? To quantify those. Is there a lot of cross protection? Is there not so much cross protection? Is this something we can also use, for example, for for repurposing drugs for um, pathogens, for example? So I think it, there is valid. It's it's valid to get started, but in the end, I mean, it it needs a lot of different, you know, steps to see whether this is then actually true in in patients. So what really helps me <laughs> in such a moment of you know, it's not enough, and we should do more. Is, is that these things of many drugs, we see the effect in patient cohorts as well. So it's not completely off, but we definitely will miss a lot of things as well. Um, yeah, but I, I don't see another possibility how to decrease complexity and have really like a disentangle effects um, as we can do in our system. Perfect. Yeah, and with that, um, we are out of time. I just want to thank our speakers again for two amazing talks and also sticking around for quite a while to take a lot of questions. So uh, thanks so much for joining us. It was really awesome to have you here and uh, hear about your work. Um, yeah, and with that, we conclude the first session of our symposium. Huge virtual applause again to our speakers. And thanks so much. And we'll be back after a short break. Thanks so much. Bye. Thanks thank for you. having me. <laughs>
Hello and welcome back. Um, my name is Carl Geiser. I am a research associate here at ISB uh, and it is my absolute delight to be here. Um, I'm looking forward to chairing this session um, and we're going over uh, the commensal host interaction and diseases today. And um, to that effect, we have two fantastic speakers uh, on this topic, uh, Dr. Arjun uh, Rahman and Dr. Anna Weil. Um, just a reminder that these talks will be back to back. Um, we will have a panel discussion after both speakers have had an opportunity to present. Uh, so if you have any great Q&A questions, please uh, save them, uh, put them in the, in the Q&A button, and please uh, remember to address the speaker when you ask the question um, so we know who to, to point the question out. So um, if I could ask uh, Dr. Rahman to share his screen. Um, Dr. Rahman is the assistant, is currently, is currently assistant. I'm sorry? Okay, uh, one moment, just a quick technical difficulty. Okay, that should be better. All right. Um, yes, Dr. Rahman is currently an assistant professor of pathology at uh, University of Chicago, uh, which is where he got his start. Uh, he uh, earned his Bachelor of Arts in Physics and his Bachelor of Science in Chemistry there uh, before moving on to the University of Texas Southwestern, where he um, were, uh, worked in the Radith Nathian lab, uh, applying statistical um, genetics to help identify residues of protein function. Um, after he earned his doctorate uh, in 2017, he then moved on uh, as a postdoctoral fellow in 2020 um, in Gordon's lab as, uh, at Washington University in St. Louis. And uh, there he used uh, applied analytical techniques uh, to create mathematical representations of microbes important to gut microbiome function and uh, adaptation. Um, his current lab explores these underlying principles of structure function of these complex biological systems. And I think he has a wonderful talk for us today going over the statistical design of function of the functional microbiome. So go ahead and take it, uh, Dr. Ramon. Thank you very much. Um, can you guys see my screen? I just want to make sure that this desktop is the right one. Like you can see a title. Yes, but it's not in presenting mode. It's not in presenter mode. How about now? Now, now it's in presenter mode. Okay, great. Um, th thank you very much for that kind introduction. Thank you um, to the organizers for inviting me. I'm I'm really excited to share um, what is an unpublished story from our lab. Uh, and um, really work that was done by one fantastic postdoc, Corito Oliveira. Um, so before I get into it, um, perhaps I could, uh, my lab started in October, or uh, in fall of 2020. So we've been at the University of Chicago for on the order of three years um, within the pathology department, but also in a microbiome center called the Duchess Watt Family Institute that is uh, geared towards understanding the human gut microbiome for augmenting human health. And what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about what my lab does and then how we got into the um, journey of trying to create synthetic microbiomes uh, for, uh, for health purposes. So um, to start, we have been, um, some, probably since 2010s, we've been, we've been thinking about um, synthetic biology as a fourth technological revolution. Uh, and the immense promise that it holds for solving lots of problems, not just in human health, but in um, climate tech and, and agricultural health. But turns out that it's like very hard to, to uh, perform synthetic biology in any scalable way. And when we boil this difficulty down to um, maybe perhaps a fundamental reason, it's because these kinds of systems that nature has created are incredibly complex. So here is a, an example of such a system, E. coli, that we're all familiar with. It contains thousands of genes, and amongst those contains millions of gene interactions, because the function of whatever phenotype we care about generally comes from 
not just a single gene, but the emergent architecture of many genes that interact with each other. So as a result, because we currently don't have frameworks for emergence, there's no statistical framework to describe how parts interact together to create collective wholes without um, invoking some sort of grand designer. Our current quote design principle for synthetic biology can really be boiled down to trial and error. We swap out parts or we mutate parts and we see what, some, what works and we perform high throughput phenotypic screens to finally get at a solution if we are able to arrive at one. So one of the central thrusts of our lab is to try to understand rules of emergence. That is how do individual parts, whether those parts are amino acids that create a protein or genes that create a genome, or in the case that I'm gonna talk about today, bacteria that create microbiomes, can we learn rules of biosystems engineering that can make this process far more scalable and perhaps more precise with respect to specific target functions that we would like to design towards. So uh, like I said today, I I'm gonna be talking about one project in the lab, which has been our attempts at trying to um, create design principles uh, for uh, designing synthetic microbiomes against specific target functions. And um, what I'd like to start with is what the current design principles are. So um, here I have a list of bacteria, and uh, I think with all of the technological advances that have happened over the, maybe the past decade or so, we, aren't able, we are now able to high-throughput phenotype uh, bacteria to a remarkable degree. We can genome sequence them. We can metabolomically profile them. We can, we can figure out what they grow uh, together with. And as a result of uh, advances in culture omics and in uh, multi-omic profiling, we can do things like start putting together bacteria, combining them based on specific features. And what I'm showing you here is a schematic where we combine, let's say, uh, Longum, Prasnitsii, and, and Ahedrus together, and we hope that collectively they do something based on their individual features. But inevitably, um, I think more often than not, what we find is that it's very difficult to predict what it, the consortia is going to do relative to the individual bacteria. I don't think this is necessarily a surprise, but the, but the, um, the question is, how does one contend with complexity and emergence in, uh, in these kinds of systems. Because we, again, going back to what I said earlier, because we have no framework for predicting what's going to happen based on the individual parts, this becomes a fundamentally intractable problem. The, the number of combinations that one needs to probe in order to arrive at what are the correct combinations of bugs given many more bugs than one could choose from becomes quickly astronomical without constraint and models guiding um, how to build such consortia. So um, our approach was to, I say here, use the same engineering process as nature. And what I mean by that is that uh, evolution has also faced the problem of complexity, but has managed to converge on solutions in finite time without like burning the ocean, so to speak, without um, needing infinite resources to do so. And how, the question is how? Well, there's one sort of grand design principle of nature, which is selection and variation iteratively. That is, you uh, create a system, you vary it in a specific way, select, see what happens, and then uh, iterate back. So we actually tried to do this um, in the lab with the idea of creating consortia. So the basic premise was we would take a strain bank, which would be our parts list, so lots of different bugs. We would design lots of uh, consortia. We would build them. We would test them in the lab for a specific function. We would annotate each community by whether or not the function was achieved. And then we would apply statistical learning principles, machine learning and artificial intelligence to try to now understand the constraints that would specify a functional consortium. Then we would go back and design, build, test, learn, design, build, test, learn. And in this sort of instantiation of evolution, the only wrinkle that's added here is that we would learn a model 
explicitly rather than continue to uh, go through this cycle without uh, maybe reflecting on what we had done through the design build test framework. I would argue that what evolution does is, is learn through fitness. That is whatever exists is the thing that is now going to be able to propagate to the next uh, generation. So what does this critically do that allows uh, potentially a, a huge advantage relative to um, what I'll call bottom-up design? Well, it strips the way the need to know anything about how any of the parts work uh, individually, how they interact, or how function is manifest. So an alternative to this would be that if we in instantiated a function like I want to kill a multi-drug resistant pathogen like Klebsiella and pneumonia, I would need to know extremely intricate details about how to do that. In this uh, formalism, one, one does not need to know these things. Um, the, the contra, uh, the, the downside is that a priori, you don't know how many cycles you need to go through. One may need to go through like a hundred cycles in which case this whole um, strategy would also be defunct. So um, we decided to undertake this strategy and the, the test function that we decided to go after was killing uh, multi-drug resistant Klebsiella pneumonia. Um, Klebsiella pneumonia is a, a pathogen that overgrows in the setting of uh, prolonged antibiotic exposure in the clinic. It's a World Health Organization priority one pathogen, which means that the antibiotic resistance uh, of these bugs is increasing at a rate that's critical. And the specific strain that we decided to use for instantiating this formalism is a strain called MH258, which is uh, a strain that is known to be um, multi-drug resistant. It has a carbapenemase uh, gene in it, and it was isolated from a patient at Memorial Sloan Kettering um, who, who uh, showed signs and symptoms of multi-drug resistant um, Klebsiella pneumonia infection. So, um, so where do we start with trying to do this? Well, the first thing that we need is a parts vault, so to speak. Um, as part of the Duchessois Family Institute at the University of Chicago, uh, we have access to a large uh, bank of commensal bacterial strains that were isolated from 28, 28 healthy human donors. And by here, what we mean by healthy, it's always difficult to define, but uh, we screen for uh, prior antibiotic use, obesity, and a slew, of other, um, a slew of other clinical indications to ensure that these people uh, had commensal strains and not pathogenic strains. We isolated these strains and whole genome sequenced them. And in total, um, our, the strain bank that we used for, uh, for our design, build, test, learn strategy comprise of almost 700 strains. What you're seeing on the right here is a phylogenetic um, classification of those strains based on 16S sequencing. And you can see that we're heavily, uh, like a normal gut microbiota, we're heavily, um, or the normal statistical distribution of human gut microbiotas, we're heavily uh, biased towards lacnose and bacteroidaceae um, with, uh, with a slew of other um, families of bacteria that are commonly found in uh, human guts. So um, imagine one now opens a freezer, sees uh, 700 tubes, each one carrying one of these bacteria, the blind design space. And what we mean by that is if each bacteria is considered its own independent source of information, the total design space is two to the 700. So this is clearly not, not, a, not a tenable uh, metric. It's a gigantic space verging on infinite. Doesn't matter how many liquid handling robots one has, we will never be able to cover this space. And so the first thing that we wanted to do was employ a model of constraint. So um, we created an alignment, a genomic alignment of all of these bacteria based on their orthologous gene groups and then performed the UMAP based decomposition of that alignment. So all a UMAP is, it's called a uniform manifold approximation projection. All it is, is uh, clusters. So anywhere you see a circle here, that's one of the bacteria in this pie chart. And uh, the distance here um, doesn't mathematically mean anything like, like it would in PCA, but what it does provide is some sort of uh, definition of relatedness between two strains. And so 
the first thing that we found was that though we had 700 screens in our screen bank, in fact, it was a very low dimensional projection onto a space that told us that really we have a handful of clusters that, um, that represent uh, metagenomic diversity. So the first thing we did was to say, well, what we don't want to do is design a whole bunch of consortia that are the same consortia, uh, the same bacteria over and over again. Another way of saying that is our consortia um, shouldn't include just E. coli, E. coli, E. coli, E. coli. What we wanted to do was maximize functional non-redundancy. And so the way we did that was by utilizing the UMAP to design a set of 100 consortia based on sampling the UMAP space in an equal partitioned manner. So imagine we pick a seed bacterium randomly. The constraint for its partner would be that it needs to be maximally away from the seed bacterium in the UMAP space. And then bacteria number three needs to be maximally away from the first two clusters in the UMAP space, and so on and so forth. And this is how we would make a consortia that, in this case, uh, what you're seeing on the screen is a five-member consortia. And um, if you see the the uh, the uh, the words DMC, the letters DMC, that means Design Microbial Consortium. So um, to, to tell you what we did, we constructed 96 consortia, we picked 96 because there's a 96 well plate. So it was purely practical constraint. Um, we built 96 consortia and um, we built them across a possibility of 46 strains. And the reason we picked 46 strains is because those 46 strains spanned the diversity of the UMAP space that we see here with the totality of the 700 strains in our strain bank. And um, you can see here the uh, compositional matrix of each of those consortia. So uh, anywhere, again, you see DMC, it's a design microbial consortia with a number attached to it. Every one of the consortia was a subset of the 46 strains that we could have chosen. So at the very top, you see DMC 46. That means that it had all 46 strains. That consortia had all 46 strains in it. And we created a distribution, uh, a distribution of 96 where the average number of strains in a given consortia was 14, spanning from three to uh, 46. Then what we did was we co-cultured each of these consortia in BHIS media, brain heart infused media with cysteine, um, with uh, Klebsiella, MH258 uh, Klebsiella pneumonia strain. And we sampled every 24 hours. And what you see on the right is the time course of sampling. So we co-cultured these communities with Klebsiella pneumonia for 120 hours. And then we plated um, to see whether or not uh, we could see uh, KP growing on plates. All of this was done anaerobically because all of these uh, commensals are all from the gut. And so a majority of them are obligate anaerobes. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is um, a test of all of the, uh, is the, is the result of testing um, all of the consortia against suppressing Klebsiella pneumonia in vitro. And um, that's shown on the, on the uh, green bar, uh, bar, bar graph on the right. And what you can see is that there's really like a continuum of Klebsiella pneumonia suppression across all of these consortia. And what you also see is that it doesn't really correlate with complexity, which is on the complexity of the consortia, which is on the gray, uh, gray uh, bar. Um, so another way of saying that is that it doesn't matter if, if, um, if uh, the consortia has a lot of strains or, or a few number of strains, there's, there, it doesn't, it doesn't the, the number of strains that the consortia has doesn't map to how well it performs. So next, what we did was we split this data set into a training and validation data set. And so we trained a, a, a very sort of standard machine learning model. This is a random forest model on 70% um, of this data and then trained on the, um, uh, and validated on the remaining 30%. And we got good statistics for uh, predictive capacity. But then what we did was we um, tested our model on the ability to, to predict the efficacy of new consortia, meaning consortia that are not within this 96. 
We created 60 new consortia. They abide, they abided by the same probability distribution as before, a span of sizes ranging from two to uh, on the order of 30 uh, members. And what I'm showing you here is on the x-axis, what our uh, RF model predicted, the KP, uh, the end KP load would be. And on the y-axis, what we actually found when we co-cultured these communities for 120 hours together. What we found was a remarkable correlation between um, the y-axis and the x-axis to the point where we could almost directly predict how well a community would suppress Klebsiella pneumonia Without knowing anything about the dynamics in between, the only thing that went into this model was the input structure, the ones and zeros that are uh, in this matrix. So the result number one was that in just one round of design, build, test, learn, using the design strategy that we did, which was maximizing UMAP diversity, we converged on a model that could predict the suppressive capacity of, of, um, the, of a complex consortia on Klebsiella pneumonia. So one of the questions that we then had was, what are the constraints on consortia function? The, the RF model doesn't tell us what are the number of numbers we need to synthesize a, a uh, maybe a sparse um, design microbial consortia. And, and why this is an important question is because typically we think about strain dropouts as the way to do this. But strain dropouts don't tell us about emergent, um, emergent capacities or higher order cooperativity amongst complex, uh, complex consortia. So we actually used our model to, train, uh, to, to score 100,000 consortia in silico. And as a result, what we got was a histogram. That's what you see on this plot. And what we did was we took a threshold and we said anything that lives, any consortia that lives uh, on this side of the histogram is a consortia that works particularly well. So, whoop, let's see. We then created a uh, matrix of all of the consortia that were predicted to work such that they suppressed uh, Klebsiella pneumonia to a significant degree. We again made a presence absence matrix of this. And then what we did was defined patterns of covariance that mapped to Klebsiella pneumonia suppression. So the way we did that was we performed a technique called singular value decomposition on the matrix that you see on the left. And we asked which eigenvectors map to Klebsiella, predicted Klebsiella pneumonia suppression the most. And what you're seeing here is uh, on the x-axis, principal component 46 which um, you know, I don't think anyone ever looks at, but turns out that was the one that most correlated with predicted KP load. Um, principal component 46 held less than 0.01% variance, but mapped very nicely onto how much uh, Klebsiella pneumonia was predicted from our model to be at the end of 120 hours of co-culture. And what I'm showing you here are the projections of each strain onto principal component 46. And one could think that maybe we could use this information to try to design a consortium, but the problem is when you look at this, you see just kind of like a continuous distribution of all 46 strains. There's no real hard line with respect to what interactions between these, um, between these bugs are important for us to then go and try to build. So instead what we did was we said, well, what, what, are, what, um, what is the nature of how two bacteria co-project? onto principal component 46, meaning what is their similarity of projection onto this axis that seems to be a particularly good axis to now identify function through. And what we found were these distinct blocks of um, uh, these distinct blocks of consortia. So what you see in the top left are a group of five bugs and what you see in the bottom right are a group of 10 bugs. And you see that they, they co-vary with each other across, right, on the off diagonal. And then you see this large block in the middle. Turns out that the top left and the bottom right are the top 15 bacteria in the projections of principal component 46. And so we thought this would be a particularly useful block to make. So um, I should also say that this provides a, a, a sense of which other blocks to make too. So we made all of the blocks that you see in that middle red uh, major block, we made um, three of those blocks as well. So result number two is that the inference provides insight into what consortia to build. 
We tested each one of these blocks in a variety of different environments. So first in BHIS, what you see in gray is the 46 member consortia, meaning that it has all 46 members. And block one is the top left. Block five is the bottom right. And then what you see in dark blue is block one plus five. Blocks two, three, and four comprise the large block in the middle where projections onto principal component 46 are not significant. So in BHIS, what we find is that block one plus five works quite well. We then assayed uh, these blocks in two other in vitro environments that are completely different, which are um, germ-free mice and antibiotic-treated SPF mice, where sequel contents of these mice were scraped after sacrifice, uh, filtered for their bacterial contents, and then made into media. So these conditions are very different than BHIS. And what we find is that across these different media conditions, the only consortia that worked well to suppress Klebsiella and pneumonia was block one plus five, this 15 member consortium. And so we call this uh, SYNCOM 15, um, a, a 15 member synthetic consortium. We then tested uh, this uh, consortium in a murine model of infection. We had C5J black six mice that were exposed to broad spectrum antibiotics, metronidazole, uh, neomycin, and vancomycin for four days. Then these uh, mice were then infected with Klebsiella pneumonia, MH258, were given um, three days, that, and then were given either saline, which is shown in gray, a fecal microbial transplant, which is a whole stool transplant shown in black, um, SYNCOM15 shown in green, uh, or a, uh, a um, we call it DMC19. It's, it's one of those blocks that is predicted to not suppress uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. We then let these mice grow for 21 days prior to SAC, and anywhere you see a brown dot here, it means we took a fecal sample and we assayed for Klebsiella pneumonia abundance in the fecal microbiota. So what I'm showing you here is um, on the x-axis, days post Klebsiella pneumonia infection in these mice. On the y-axis is the amount of Klebsiella pneumonia that we see. What you see at the very beginning is that all of the mice uh, across the cohorts have a large amount of Klebsiella pneumonia. They are then triply gavaged with one of the four indications that you see in the color key, um, where DMC15 is our SYNCOM15. And what we found was, was quite remarkable. Um, first off, the, the PBS-treated um, cohort showed almost a constant Klebsiella pneumonia after day six at approximately 10 to the eighth load, whereas um, the FMT showed a, a rapid drop. You see FMT in the gray. Um, showed a, a rapid drop in Klebsiella pneumonia abundance. What we found was that DMC-19, the, the consortia predicted not to work, indeed didn't work, looks like saline, but the green consortia, uh, SYNCOM-15, worked quite well. In fact, worked more rapidly than a fecal microbial transplant, um, was less variable if you look at day nine through day 17, and um, was stable in terms of uh, suppressing Klebsiella pneumonia. So what we concluded from this was that SYNCOM-15 suppressed Klebsiella pneumonia across these diverse contexts, including in a, in a murine model of, of, uh, of infection. So then the final thing I'll touch on is how does SYNCOM-15 work? We did uh, metabolic profiling of SYNCOM-15, both in vivo and in vitro. And the bottom line is that the way it works is through uh, short chain fatty acid production, as well as amino acid depletion. So what I'm showing you here are all the features that we found that differentiated consortia that worked particularly well from those that didn't. And um, what you see is that the, the features that, uh, that we pulled out were highly enriched for short chain fatty acid content and then phenylalanine and alanine depletion. And what I'm showing you here are the features that SYNCOM15 specifically showed with respect to being enriched relative to the PBS cohort in the mice. If you look at phenylalanine and alanine, what we found was that SYNCOM15 substantially suppressed phenylalanine and alanine concentrations and also increased hexanoic concentrations relative to the consortia that did not suppress uh, Klebsiella pneumonia. 
some of the other short chain fatty acids, one could argue didn't really do much to. So um, one of the mechanisms that we're continuing to try to suss out is we think that the way that this consortia works is by um, depleting amino acids and, and acidifying, potentially acidifying the environment, but certainly by producing short chain fatty acids that could potentially also involve signaling to Klebsiella pneumonia to suppress it. So um, what I'd like to conclude with is that I, I think what we've done is shown that this kind of rubric could work uh, for designing microbial consortia without knowledge about the parts, just beyond just the genome sequence of the, uh, of the strain bank that we have. And what we're testing right now are a few questions um, regarding generalizability. You'll notice here there was nothing specific about Klebsiella pneumonia. We could swap out the test function for any function we like, really. Um, and what we also learned was that uh, by using this type of way of designing consortia, we could enable translatability from one environment to another which I think has been a fundamental problem in, in the field of trying to design consortia. Basically, if you design something in one environment, it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna work in another environment. So we wanna better understand how it is that we're getting invariance of function of these synthetic systems across environments that we didn't even train on. And finally, what I'll say is that we, we wanna know whether our consortium can work in humans. We in, at the DFI are uniquely positioned to ask this question because we have, um, we will have a, a good manufacturing practice facility in-house. Um, so we're hoping that we can create this consortia in-house and start a clinical trial for uh, people who are suffering from recurrent Klebsiella pneumonia infections. So with that, um, I would really like to thank uh, Rita, who was the single, uh, really the single postdoc who did all of the work that I showed today. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, my, uh, my Close collaborator, Sepa Kuhn, um, and some people from his team, Mahmoud Youssef and Kishak Lee, um, Robert Chen, who I knew from Jeff Gordon's lab, and um, Eric Pamer for uh, providing a lot of support and being a co-mentor for uh, Rita as she went along with this. And, and thanks to um, many of the people who pay the bills. Thank you. All right, wonderful. Uh, thank you, yeah. Um, lots of good questions on that. We'll um, go ahead and save them uh, for the Q&A session. Um, thank you, Dr. Rahman. Really interested to hear, hear the answer to these questions. Um, but let's jump right into our next uh, our next speaker. Uh, next we'll have Dr. Uh, Anna Weil, um, who is currently the Assistant Professor in the Department of Medicine at, uh, at UW, uh, University of Washington. Um, yeah, feel free to, to share your screen. Um, she did her, uh, after her undergraduate work at the uh, University of California, Berkeley, she did a Master of Public Health at Johns Hopkins and uh, earned, earned that degree in 2009. Um, then she moved to uh, earn her medical doctorate at Tufts University, um, uh, after which she did a residency uh, at Massachusetts General Hospital in Internal Medicine uh, in 2013, moving on and completing her fellowship in infectious disease. Uh, in 2015, and then um, uh, she entered the position of a physician scientist um, until moving her lab uh, to, to, to Seattle, so our area, neck of the woods. So um, we're very happy to hear your talk. Um, her research focuses on generally uh, enteric diseases and uh, gut microbes and how they interact with like Vibrio coli uh, pathogenesis and um, understanding how these gut microbes uh, modify immune responses and uh, especially as it concerns oral vaccines. And her talk today will be the gut microbiota and uh, immune response to oral vaccination. So. Okay, thank you so much for the introduction and for the invitation to speak. Uh, can you see my screen okay? Okay, great. Uh, um, 
Thank you again for the invitation. I'm Anna Weil. I'm a physician scientist here at the University of Washington, and my lab is in the Center for Emerging and Reemerging Infectious Diseases. So I'm going to be talking today about um, kind of our pipeline going from human samples all the way to studying some of the interactions uh, both between the host and the pathogen and also between uh, gut microbes and the pathogen. Uh, so I'll start uh, with a little bit of background about cholera. Um, it's kind of thought of as a as an ancient disease, but still occurs in many parts of the world. Uh, I'll move on to demonstrate our approach to research questions using an example from our human studies of susceptibility to infection, and move on to talk about the um, effect of the gut microbes on what we think of the immune diarrheal disease research. This is the center where uh, our, all of the human cohorts are, where um, I'll be showing you data from these today. So this is a patient presenting to this hospital, which is a large hospital, as well as research center for diarrheal diseases. You can see that this patient has a decreased level of consciousness and kind of sunken eyes is obviously not looking well, uh, presenting here to the hospital after six hours of vomiting and diarrhea. On the right side is a picture of that diarrhea. It doesn't even really look like stool because it's not brown, uh, and which really exemplifies what happens in um, cholera, which is that all the fluid from your body you know, is leaving your body uh, in large amounts. <clears throat> so this patient looked like this after just six hours of rehydration. Uh, antibiotics are also used to treat cholera, but they are not essential. Uh, the main treatment is really just support of rehydration during that time when Vibrio cholera is bound to the gut epithelium and is making cholera toxin, which is producing this diarrhea. But once the epithelium is um, shed, then the infection runs its course, which can be usually a short illness, but people just need support through that time. So it's using patients like this, uh, where we have uh, studied these human cohorts of cholera patients um, and are now looking into the microbiome. So uh, this is the front of the main hospital. Uh, I spent a year here as a medical student working in the laboratory of Dr. Ferdowsi Kadri, who is an expert in Vibrio cholera immunology. Um, in this study, we were looking at household contacts of cholera patients. So uh, this is the essentially the study design of all of the cases I'll be talking through, but we enroll a household case as they come into the hospital on day zero, uh, enroll them into the study, enroll their household contacts, since we presume that there's a shared exposure to Vibrio cholera, either through a shared water source in the household or community or through person-to-person -person contact. So at that time of enrollment, we ask questions about their symptoms during the previous week and then follow them prospectively uh, to see if they're shedding Vibrio cholera, so are they infected or not? But this time point is really unique in, um, in microbiome studies, especially of infectious disease, because we have this point of exposure before people develop infection. So from this time point, when we enroll the household contacts, going forward in time, we can see, do they become infected or do they remain uninfected? And that's the comparison we'll be, we'll be talking about. Additionally, there are many household contacts and people who develop cholera, in, you know, vibrio cholera infection, but actually don't develop any symptoms. And we're also interested in the microbiota that um, might help protect people from symptoms, as well as those that may protect from infection. So to uh, discuss how we think the microbiome might be impacting vibrio cholera pathogenesis, I want to just talk about a few of the virulence factors that are critical in this infection. So uh, pathogens are ingested through contaminated water, uh, and in the small intestine, they colonize in that area. This is different from C. diff, which you've been talking about a lot at this symposium, uh, which uh, acts in the large intestine. So motility through the small intestinal mucus is one of the main virulence factors. Uh, then uh, there are two major ones that occur that are expressed right at the epithelial surface, and that's the toxin coregulated pilus, which is a colonization factor, and then cholera toxin that actually mediates uh, the diarrhea through the mechanism shown on the right here in this figure. Uh, then once there's a group of Vibrio cholera at the surface, biofilm is produced to protect the group from detaching from the epithelium and from the effects of luminal flow in the small intestine. 
But when these bacteria signal to each other that there's a large amount of them through quorum sensing and environmental signals, they stop expressing virulence factors, detach from the epithelium, and go back out into the environment to infect other people. Uh, and this figure was made by Denise Chak, a postdoctoral researcher in my group who is responsible for much of the work I'll be talking about. So we first looked at susceptibility to Vibrio cholera in household contacts, first uh, using 16S sequencing. This was the very first study a number of years ago. Uh, and we used a support vector machine learning model to uh, identify OTUs that were most associated with developing infection versus remaining uninfected. Uh, and we used a testing and training um, data set, as you saw in the last talk. Uh, this here results are shown as a holdout validation, where we uh, create this prediction on one set of household contacts and then test it on another. And what we found was that the microbiota measured here by OTUs um, predicted the outcome, whether a person became infected or remained uninfected, better than the clinical risk factors that we know exist for developing infection. Uh, as you can see here, the clinical risk factors don't predict infection very well, uh, since the line is pretty close to the kind of 50-50 of how well that prediction was made. Uh, and those clinical risk factors are age, um, blood group, and previous exposure to Vibrio cholera. So based on this, we want to delve deeper into, you know, which what, you know, more specifically, what genes and what species and strains might be responsible for this effect. Uh, so we next used a larger cohort of household contacts and conducted metagenomic. Uh, this time machine learning was done with random forests uh, and a few other tools. And our goal in this setting was to identify the discriminating species uh, that were associated with infection versus protection and also those that were associated with symptomatic disease versus asymptomatic disease. Uh, and again, this is a deep dive, you know, really, but it's all correlations between uh, a clinical outcome and the microbiota. These are correlative data that, um, you know, could be other markers for other things about the host uh, or about um, the immune system response to the pathogen or something related to direct competition. You know, at this point, we really were trying to delve deeper to understand what strains to test in vitro. Uh, and we were able to achieve that with this analysis. So um, since this is kind of an example of our approach, I'm just gonna go quickly on this one slide through uh, the next steps we used and one of the conclusions we reached. And this is about the virulence factor biofilm production. So one of the highly ranked species we saw was called Paracoccus aminovorans. This is a soil microbe that uh, is not very well, uh, was not very well known, uh, was present in the microbiota of people living really only in lower income countries. Uh, and when we screen this microbe with Vibrio cholera in vitro for in changes in cholera toxin production or toxin coagulated pilus production, we found that in the presence of Paracoccus, Vibrio cholera made much more biofilm. And this was unique because Paracoccus on its own didn't make any biofilm. Uh, and what we found by examining these further uh, was that there was a lot of Vibrio cholera in this pellicle, which is the top part of the biofilm, and much uh, and and but not really any difference in the amount of Vibrio cholera growing in the planktonic part of the culture. Uh, we tested this effect using um, mutants for different aspects of biofilm production, and we found that this effect was VPSL dependent. VPSL is uh, the gene that encodes um, the extracellular matrix production of biofilm. So it's the main infrastructure piece uh, of the Vibrio cholera biofilm. So somehow this, this presence of Paracoccus was resulting in, uh, was dependent upon um, the VPSL production. So we then, uh, with collaborators at Tufts University, um, colonized mice with Paracoccus, uh, made sure that we were not ablating the microbiota of these mice with Paracoccus, but that we were really adding it to the what was in the the current milieu of those mice, and then uh, tested to see if there was a difference in host colonization. And we found that there was, and that this was also VPSL dependent, whether we infected the mice with Paracoccus ahead of time uh, as a pre-colonization step, or if we um, colonized them with Vibrio cholera and Paracoccus at the same time. Using RNA-seq from co- and monocultures, we found that there was much more VPSL production. Uh, when Paracoccus was present, and then using imaging with a collaborator, um, Jin Yang at Yale University, we found that these two microbes really were coexisting within the biofilm, which was the first time this had been observed in Vibrio cholera, and that this might have a clinical 
um, clinical importance in increasing host colonization. So uh, this is just an example of how we aim to use human data and metagenomics to essentially identify bacterial species or strains or genes uh, that we can then test in vitro and in models. Uh, and we aim to do this using strains isolated from the study population. Uh, the goal of this work ultimately is to identify bacterial candidates or their metabolites that decrease vibrio cholera virulence rather than increase. Uh, such that these could be used in the form of a probiotic, for example, um, as a prophylactic in a high-risk setting, such as in those households where people are um, exposed to vibrio cholera and have that high risk after the initial case in their household, or in places like refugee camps where achieving something as simple as clean water might be uh, not possible in the short term. Um, and so uh, this arm of the work in my lab is continuing, continuing forward, but I'm going to switch gears to talk about how we've applied this approach to the gut microbiota and oral cholera vaccines. Uh, so the World Health Organization uh, has been focused on cholera control and reducing this 90% um, by the year 2030. Uh, this has been um, not achieved, I'll say, unfortunately, uh, for many reasons. Uh, and uh, the path to 2030 is not looking super uh, likely at this point. Uh, but one of the main tools in the toolbox for reducing cholera cases is the use of oral cholera vaccines. So we chose to study this partly because oral cholera vaccines have very limited efficacy in very vulnerable groups, especially in children, which make up half of cholera deaths. And also the protection, the duration of protection is quite short. Um, so the questions we were asking ourselves in these studies first was, is there a relationship at all between the gut microbiota and immune responses to oral cholera vaccines? And then are there any strains or metabolites that could boost vaccine responses? Um, so as I mentioned, uh, vaccine efficacy is limited. Um, but also there's kind of a bigger picture question about how the gut microbiota may impact immune responses to oral vaccines and vaccine efficacy. It's been observed in many trials of oral vaccines, especially in children, that these vaccines can have great immune responses and even great efficacy when they're tested uh, in mostly Western countries. But then when field trials are done in the countries where these vaccines are needed, the vaccine efficacy is lower and the immune responses to vaccination is lower. And it's not really known why this is. Uh, it could be diet, it could be, you know, the confounding effects of malnutrition and other parts of the environment, but the gut microbiota and differences in this is, a, is one main um, proposed reason. So the study design here is similar to what I mentioned before. These are patients from the ICDDRB who had have not had antibiotics in the previous two weeks, do not have diarrhea and have not had prior oral cholera vaccines. They get two doses of the WHO approved and currently um, the vaccine that makes up the WHO stockpile for emergencies, which is a killed whole cell inactivated formulation. And then we collect um, their immune responses after this. And this is again in partnership with Dr. Ferdowsi Kadri at the ICDDRB and our partners at Mass General. So the immune correlate we're gonna to use to discuss the results is the memory B cell specific to the O specific polysaccharide of the Vibrio cholera LPS. It's a mouthful, but just to say, this is the marker of immunity uh, that seems to be most closely linked to protection. Uh, antibodies to the O specific polysaccharide um, bind to the uh, flagellum of Vibrio cholera and decrease motility. And this seems to be the mechanism of protection, although uh, this is a newer discovery and it's somewhat debated still what is the correct correlate of immunity um, for these studies. <clears throat> so uh, we found that the gut microbiota at the time of vaccination, we're looking first at this day zero stool, did have a relationship with the OSB specific memory B cell responses. Uh, this, so what we did here was really split our vaccine vaccinees into groups of responders and non-responders and then compare the gut microbiota between those groups. What we found was that there were specific gut microbial profiles that were from people more likely to respond, but these were overlapping groups. As you can see in this PCOA, this is um, work done by Denise, uh, who I mentioned previously. Um, this, you know, obviously overlapping groups and there's a lot of more to uh, 
to tease out here. So we started by using fecal extracts from responders and non-responders and comparing the response of stimulation with these fecal extracts in THP1-derived human macrophages and cell culture. Uh, we use this model because this is a, a model we previously created and validated for studying innate immune responses to Vibrio cholera uh, vaccines. And the reason we study innate responses is because we know that um, the innate response to infection or to vaccination seems to be critical in um, generating and maintaining those memory B cells that uh, provide the long-term protection. So uh, we studied a range of innate immune cytokines in this study. Um, I'm just showing two here. IL-6 and IL-1-beta are canonical innate immune cytokines. Usually they're co-regulated, but what we found was that they uh, were different in responders and non-responders, but in different directions. So this was surprising, but was enough for us to take the next step um, to try to tease these relationships out with a lot more precision. So uh, what we did next was um, use a larger cohort, again, of, um, of vaccine vaccinees using metagenomics. Um, we did a analysis to essentially try to identify specific genes from the full metagenomic data set that were associated with the clinical outcome. And we did this using a co-abundant gene analysis. So uh, this type of analysis uh, we worked with Sam Minot from the Fred Hutch, who designed this method. He a, 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 has a lot of expertise in metagenomic methods. And a student in my lab, a medical student, um, Fred Heller, uh, spent a year uh, working through this computational data and making sense of these co-abundant gene groups. Uh, so these are groups of genes associated with an outcome. And these we mapped back onto the reference genomes from this data set. So Fred's uh, work was really focused on translating these CAGs that were highly linked to our immune response and translating this back um, to understand which bacterial strains specifically had the most of these CAGs and that, that we should weight with the most importance and then test in vitro. So to do this, he created a priority score to quantify the strength of the association between the CAGs and the bacterial genome. Um, Oops, sort of jumping ahead. So uh, to do this, th there's a big equation that includes all of these aspects that I'm not showing, but I'm happy to show it if anyone's interested. Uh, but essentially the score is independent of CAG size since smaller CAGs are more likely to map to genomes than large ones. Uh, this score accounts for the number of CAGs mapping to each genome and then discriminates between strains uh, within one species. So using this data, uh, we uh, again created a list of candidate strains this time that were uh, of the most interest to us. And I just want to illustrate one thing about that analysis. Um, the priority scores here are shown in this tree on the right side with the black, I keep jumping ahead for some reason, are, are the black ones with the, um, are next to the, the uh, strain name were the ones with the highest priority score. So what we found was that, as you can see here in B theta is a good example where this strain was highly linked to the clinical outcome, but the next few that are obviously the same species were not as closely linked. So I kind of tried to quantify this in this table by showing the proportion of, of strains within these species that were highly ranked. So this is just to illustrate that these uh, correlations and identifications of um, highly ranked CAGs were very strain specific. So when we're isolating bacteroides from the study population, it was important that we identify strains that have these specific genes of interest. So getting back to our results, um, we basically found that those most highly ranked species here, this is a summary of the species that had strains that were most highly ranked, um, were often, uh, genera that were associated with producing sphingolipids. This was a surprise to us because most um, bacteria don't make sphingolipids. Sphingolipids are ubiquitously created by eukaryotes, but they're only made by a few bacterial genera. Um, and the gene that we first kind of validated these results with was the serine palmitoyl transferase gene, uh, a gene required for de novo synthesis of sphingolipids by bacteria. So we went back to the entire metagenomic data set and looked at the SPT gene content that was, you know, strain independent between responders and non-responders and found that there was 
uh, a difference. Uh, and with this, we decided to take some next steps. First, to try to identify which lipids might be um, effector molecules potentially in this in this uh, situation. So uh, we first conducted lipidomics on, on the stool from vaccine responders and non-responders. Uh, we did this at the Northwest Metabolomics Research Center. And in this analysis, we found some lipids that were highly uh, correlated with response that were not, um, it was not possible to determine if those were human derived or bacterial derived or plant derived from diet, et cetera. Uh, but we really focused on some of these sphingolipids and ceramides that we found, um, which made up a lot of the hits of uh, the lipids that were more likely to be found in vaccine responders. Um, just a little bit of background about sphingolipids is that importantly, uh, bacterial derived sphingolipids are possible to be distinguished from eukaryotic sphingolipids. And this was important for us, you know, in studying these in vitro to understand um, that we could identify potentially molecules from bacteria and not just from the host. So microbes produced odd numbered and branched sphingolipids, uh, and there are specific inhibitors that exist to inhibit um, the steps of synthesis of these um, sphingolipids in bacteria, which was also critical for our in vitro assays. So we next took um, strains that were isolated from the study population. Uh, most of the strains were isolated by Chelsea Dunmire, who spent over a year really just isolating bacteria and identifying them from the study population. Uh, and just to talk about um, briefly a few of those strains, one SPT positive strain of Bacteroides zeylani solvens and another B. Frage. Um, we worked with Libin Zhu from the Department of Medicinal Chemistry here to examine what specific ceramides and sphingolipids were made in the supernatant of these microbes. And we found that there were several candidate species um, that were made by these bacteria compared to controls such as um, SPT negative Bacteroides. Um, so we, you know, we are continuing on this path of examining the specific lipids that may be responsible uh, for some of the effects that we've seen. Um, and at this time, we also kind of shifted to look more at what models we could use to test those eventual effector models and these bacterial strains. Um, so I mentioned earlier, we have a model for testing any immune responses to oral cholera vaccines. I just have a schematic of how we use this here. Um, this model we initially created to test um, vaccine strain versus natural infection uh, strains of Vibrio cholera as a model to understand the differences between vaccine-induced uh, immunity and natural infection. This model is um, macrophage-based, which, which is a primary innate immune cell in the lamina propria level, um, just under the epithelium that provides much of the innate immune response to infection. From this cell culture model, after stimulating with the antigen of your choice or sphingolipids. Um, this can be used for amino assays and then also for um, further molecular work and um, sequencing. We do um, assess a lot of gene transcripts from, from these models. So what we next uh, performed, and this is uh, work by Denise, was to separate out the lipids from these um, monocultures of Bacteroides species uh, and used in this process myriacin, which is an inhibitor of that SPT gene. So here we could examine, you know, whole cell lysates as well as the metabolites made by these bacteria, uh, some of the debris and cell membrane components, and then compare these to um, lipids, including sphingolipids from these bacteria or uh, the lipid fraction without sphingolipids. So what we found was that in the presence of um, sphingolipids, I'll skip through um, the metabolites and cell membrane, which do not have many differences uh, to the lipid fraction. This is of Bacteroides zeylani solvens that we did find that when the sphingolipids were not present, there was much more of this innate immune um, effect in some of these cytokine responses. Um, so at that point, we wanted to test how the effect of these lipids might impact immune response to vaccination, which is our ultimate goal in this work is to understand um, how uh, bacteria or its metabolite might help to boost vaccine responses. So we then tested um, the model using sphingolipids with the strain JBK70, which is a vaccine strain 
uh, it's a Vibrio cholera strain that doesn't have any cholera toxin, and it's analogous to the strain that's in the vaccine stockpile currently. Again, we saw when we pre-treated uh, the cells with sphingolipids that there was less inflammation um, compared to when we, these were not pre-treated, but that somewhat paradoxically, uh, with less inflammation present prior to vaccination, once we stimulated with the vaccine strain, there was a much greater vaccine response. So this was in agreement with the human data that we originally were assessing, but it was surprising. Um, we thought initially we would see that sphingolipids might be inflammatory and cause a response uh, in the cells that was like an adjuvant, you know, causing inflammation and priming the innate immune response so, such that it could be even greater when an antigen was introduced. But what we saw was actually the opposite, that sphingolipids seemed to reduce baseline inflammation, but then somehow mediate an increased innate immune response to those vaccine antigens. So we learned since that this is a paradigm seen in some other vaccines where having a lower uh, baseline inflammation can allow a greater immune response to antigen. So this is our working hypothesis right now. So in summary, we found that uh, in fecal samples that there are, there's, there are different lipid species present in different abundances between vaccine responders and non-responders and that there is um, a difference in um, specifically IL-6 when we stimulate uh, host um, or human macrophages with these fecal extracts. And that when we identify the spe specific species that make these sphingolipids and confirm that these produce sphingolipids of interest, uh, in this model, we found that these also reduce innate immune cytokines and also increase responses to the OCB vaccine strain. So our next steps uh, are to look into other bacterial groups uh, and understand more about which effector molecule, and also to profile the innate immune response more thoroughly than only macrophages. And one of the ways that Denise is working on doing that right now is by integrating our macrophage model with probably a duodenal enteroid, uh, intestinal epithelial layer, or we could use also cell culture of intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, and these, this work is ongoing to understand more about um, both uh, what part of sphingolipids is causing this interaction, what innate immune pathway uh, is involved and how this might be operationalized further for use in humans. So I'm not sure why my slides were skipping around a lot, so sorry about that. Um, something must be off with the timings on this, uh, this PowerPoint. Uh, but quickly, I wanted to acknowledge in my lab, Denise Chak uh, and others I mentioned here, um, those at Mass General and the ICDDRB who are responsible for the initiation and maintenance of many of these cohorts, Sam Minot at Fred Hutch, um, at the University of Montreal, Jesse Shapiro and his group who we worked on our initial studies with, um, Libin Zhu in the Department of Medicinal Chemistry and Wei Liang Ng at Tufts who does um, the mouse work in the um, pathogen interaction with the gut microbes I mentioned and those at the Northwest Metabolomics Research Center. And with that, thank you. Um, I look forward to the panel and any of your questions and please evaluate my talk with this QR code if you can. And I will stop there. All right, uh, thank you, Dr. Weil. Uh, that was uh, that was really, really interesting talk. So, um, all right, I guess we'll, Move into the Q and A session. We have uh, we have a ton of questions, so I'll go ahead and uh, look through our what we've got. And All right. All right. So I guess I'll start with uh, you, Dr. Raman. Um, so I'll just go on the more upvoted questions and then uh, work our way down. So did you look, the question is, did you look at metabolic functional features that differentiated the effective consortium from an entire fetal homogenate? That is like FMT. Yes. Um, yes, we did. It, we found the same sorts of things that that we had found with respect to the consortia that were um, not working, but our 
interpretation of that is that the synthetic consortium that we have are working in a completely different way than the FMT. The, the FMT is um, is from a you know a mouse fecal pellet. The strains that we have are from human commensal, they're human commensal bacteria. So it's a funny model system in that sense because the, the interactions are not necessarily going to be along the same axis. The metabolomics directly correlates with this. The, the mechanism by which the FMT works is likely more of a reconstitution mechanism. But when we looked at the 16S sort of engraftment statistics of our consortium, what we found was a transient engraftment and then they all went away. And it correlated with KP going down. So um, what we think is that the, this, the short chain fatty acid production and the depletion of the amino acids are um, specific to the consortia that we made, not like a global trend for uh, fecal microbial transplant. Interesting. Um, by the way, I forgot to mention, if either of you two have questions for each other, feel free to jump in. Um, you know, I hopefully, yeah, I can keep it interactive if, if, uh, if, if, you know, you have anything. I actually you know, do, but, but that's okay. We can burning jump. curiosity, so to speak. So, um, all right, I guess I'll bounce over to, to you, Dr. Weil. Um, let's see. Do you think uh, PA and VC interact or have co-evolved in their environmental reservoirs niches in addition to the host? And I kind of talk in It's a good question. I mean, Paracoccus aminovorans was first um, described in soil and that's really where there's really very little known about it. Um, other than that, it was noted in kind of several different microbiota studies, like population-based studies in Malawi, in South America. So it was known to be part of the gut microbiota, not in Western populations, but in other populations. And it's not very abundant at all, but I think we've seen over time that even things present in very low abundance can have a big effect um, on the gut microbiota. You know, the, the low abundance almost steered us away from looking into it further, but it was really, you know, when people have cholera, you know, we've previously shown they, you know, their microbiota is obviously obliterated with the, not just the infection, but with the treatment. Um, and there's almost not, there's really not a lot there when people have cholera, but paracoccus was still present even during cholera. So that was very curious, you know, that this low abundance organism was still there. And now it makes sense why, you know, if they were coexisting in a biofilm during infection, then that um, so that is kind of what caught our eye, but did they co-evolve in their environmental reservoirs? I mean, I don't, I have not ever heard of paracoccus described in the ocean, which is really where Vibrio cholera lives it, in um, low salinity kind of, you know, areas where fresh and fresh water and salt water mix. Uh, I don't know that paracoccus has ever been described in those environments. So I would say probably not. I'm not sure, you know, um, how they are benefiting from one another other than that they live together in this environment and have some more protection from having increased biofilm. All right, interesting. Um, all right, uh, huh. All right, Dr. Dr. Raman, um, this one is pretty highly uploaded now. I don't know that I mentioned that I was doing them in order of like popularity, a bunch of people jumped in. Um, how uh, how can you confirm that microbial strains from 20 different healthy individuals didn't inhibit the growth of each other in, in the consortia? I mean, we can't. Um, that, that's, that, and it's, um, we can't, and um, that's kind of the point uh, in a lot of ways. Like, like, we want to assume nothing about um, what is possibly interacting with each other. All we care about is the ultimate function. In the same way that evolution doesn't care about what interacts with each other, all it cares about is fitness. Um, so our idea was to create willy-nilly, so to speak, I mean, with the constraint of genomic diversity, create lots of different consortia without regard for what eventually would survive, what interacts with what, what are the dynamics uh, in between, and purely select off of functions. So it's quite possible that actually, you know, if you dig into the communities, there's a bunch of warfare going on between the commensals. And in fact, if you, you know, if anyone 
like um, took a very close look at this synthetic community 15, Syncom 15 that we made, it has um, both Blaudia and uh, Bacteroides, which are like opposite ends of the spectrum, so to speak, in the quote, enterotypes that people describe. So um, yeah, I, I, I think it is, uh, it is entirely plausible that um, there's warfare going on. But um, I think that it was, uh, it, it was consistent with our design principle to not care. All right. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right. Let's see. Um, Dr. Weil, do you think these microbial sphingolipids are having their immune effects locally on the gut epithelium, or are they going into the circulation and impacting distal tissues? Yeah, it's a good question. Microbial sphingolipids have recently been shown um, to be absorbed and integrated into the uh, into human lipid metabolism, um, which is really interesting. <laughs> Uh, that was shown primarily in, um, I believe it was in like liver and hepatic lipid processing where tagged tagged lipids that were broken down originally made by bacteria were integrated into the, into the host. So um, I think that it's most likely these are operating at the level of the epithelium and, the, and we are going to test them further in the epithelium. Um, to, to show that using um, cell culture or entroid models in addition to the other immune cells present. So I do think it's more likely happening at that surface. Um, the immune pathway of how innate immune responses impact the real color, I didn't show um, what we think it is, but it would be that that innate immune response at the surface is then stimulating um, downstream pathways that result in um, the cognate B cell and T cell interaction in the germinal center. And that this specific interaction that we think is innate in nature is related to function and development and maintenance of mucosal uh, associated invariant T cells and possibly T follicular helper cells. And we've there are several studies um, showing that these are involved in the long-term the long-term immunity that's made that then results in these memory B cells that secrete IgA, likely IgA at the surface that inhibit vibrio cholera motility. Uh, so I think that it's happening somewhere in there, right? From the, the germinal center in the lamina propria of the gut is not that far away from the gut epithelium. So <laughs> I would say distal tissues, probably not. Um, but I, I think it's happening, you know, in that gut lymphoid system somewhere. All right. Very. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. Interesting. The, all right. So Dr. Dr. Raman, are there any other tests or targets your team is interested in going after uh, in particular, like C. diff? We, we're actually um, going after VRE uh, right now, um, which we have some data on that's pretty positive so far. Um, yeah. And I, I mean, I like the spirit of that question that it's a good one, which is how one, you know, um, if it's truly a platform, so to speak, then try some other functions. And I think that's a, it's a worthwhile thing to do. So uh, it would be nice to march down, you know, a multi-drug resistant pathogen one to two to three um, and have some mapping about how easy it is to churn through to try to get to a solution. So VRE is next and then maybe one day C. diff. Cool. Uh, yeah, I hope we get there. Um, Dr. Weil, uh, have you looked to see whether human-derived uh, sphingolipids induce the same response in macrophages? Is it sphingolipids in general that produce lower baseline inflammation, better vaccine response, or is it specifically microbial-derived sphingolipids? Yeah, great question. So we have focused on testing sphingolipids, like lipids made by bacteria that are either specific species of those sphingolipids or not. So we focused more on getting to the structure of what is that lipid uh, that is that is responsible for this or that ceramide head group uh, that is a class of lipids that are mediating this. And we have not tested human-derived sphingolipids. 
although there are many of them in stool, and I'm sure, um, you know, in stool, it's a bit challenging to dissect all of these different antigens and what their effect might be. But I do, uh, we do plan to study human derived lipids as well and other lipid types. Um, but we focus mostly on fractionating lipids and really trying to identify what is the effector group or groups uh, that we can test. All right, bouncing back to you, Dr. Raman. Um, all right, so this one might be um, a bit broad, but if you already have a genome, you have access to a rich set of biological mechanistic knowledge on each organism. What if you used more of this information beyond relatedness as a prior in the design pipeline? like you've presented? Yeah, it's certainly possible to do that. Um, I'll just say one caveat. We don't know much about the genomes of these bugs. Uh, most of the genomes are homology to E. coli K12. Um, and even in that, it's like very, you know, we know I think we know 70% of the E. coli K12 genome. And then like, if you go to B. subtilis, you know, 30%. And then after that, it's like, like two percent, like it's it's very very low um, de novo functional annotation. So a lot of it's based off of homology, which is uh, incomplete. Um, so take that as a caveat. You say you you could probably parameterize on keg pathways or go pathways or something else other than what we did was orthologous gene groups, similar to to cogs from what um, or cags from what Anna was saying. Um, but uh, I, I think it's possible as as long as you're okay with the annotation scheme. So that's the biggest kind of balance that one runs is um, do you go down interpretability or do you go down what you know biology would provide you, which is the genome sequence? All right, uh, Dr. Uh, Weil, do you think patterns might be different with Prevotella? Is there epidemiological uh, evidence for differential vaccine response in people with Myrobacteroides versus Prevotella? Thanks for the question. I'll just want to comment on the previous question first. Um, that is exactly why we couldn't use CAGs to identify, you know, what strains should we test in vitro because the annotation is just not reliable. It's just not even close. Like the so that is why we had to create this method of identifying specific strains. It would have been great if we could say, wow, this function is totally related to the immune response. That would have been many steps um, further you know, into understanding potential mechanism than needing to identify a strain and then take it even take it to another step. So it's really a weakness, I think, of um, trying to study the microbiome is the, the lack of annotation uh, of so many of these anaerobes uh, and other bacteria in the gut. But that is something we definitely, hopefully as a community, can improve over time. Uh, so regarding Prevotella, great question. Prevotella, as many of you may know, is a lot harder to culture from frozen stool than bacteroides. So that's been one of our challenges. We do have a number of isolates, but just not the number we we're able to get in bacteroides, especially when this stool is being frozen in Bangladesh and shipped here. Um, those isolates are harder to come by, but we are hoping to have a way of isolating more of them in Bangladesh so that we can preserve them better and study Prevotella as well. Prevotella has so much genetic diversity. I'm sure that, um, we would have a lot of things to learn from studying Prevotella as well as Bacteroides. But for the specific uh, question of sphingolipid induced or back, um, microbially derived sphingolipids, it would be great to be able to study both of them. And we have a few strains we're working on now. All right. Um, excellent. Um, Dr. Dr. Raman, how do you think um, the functional redundancy that is present in nature, how do you think that will affect the outcome or finding of your work at, at redundancy? I, I think that, yeah, so it's a good question. Um, this 15 member consortia that we built is, is probably not a unicorn. Um, likely, like there are there are um, phylogenetic walks that one could probably take that preserve the overall function, but introduce genetic 
differences, metagenomic differences amongst the consortia that one would build. Um, and so the functional redundancy is probably useful in the sense that there are many possible solutions to one problem. Now, and that's, I think, uh, I, I think an issue with the way that we built the, what we built, because we don't include functional redundancy in our consortia design. So it's not like we're saying, well, in case this bug dies, there's another one that will come along and we'll have the same function. We, we actually um, just went into it kind of like, like just tell me the group to make. Um, I, and I think that if one were to now ask, how do you design translatability? You know, this is one of the questions that I had asked at the end, which was instead of designing a microbiome for a specific environment, how do you make a microbiome that works across environment one through N? Um, you probably do need functional redundancy there. And nature has probably done that for all, you know, our, our, um, diverse microbiotas. So I think it's a useful thing to keep in mind for future design processes. All right. Uh, and yeah, this is actually kind of a question I have too. Uh, Dr. Wild, do you, do you think the work you've done could lead to the design of like a probiotic that could be co-administered alongside vaccination for cholera? Yeah, that I mean, that would be the ultimate goal. Um, using oral cholera vaccines has been really successful in that, you know, you can use them without a cold chain of, you know, needing freezers all the way along. Uh, and they're easily administered, you know, they're very convenient. Um, but they just don't work that well, unfortunately, especially in the right groups. Uh, so there are people who are looking to study other formulations of um, vaccines as well. But this is really what we have now. And there's not like a giant pharmaceutical industry trying to make better cholera vaccines, to be honest. So, um, so you know, using the ones we have and making them better is a focus. And I think if there was a way to administer a probiotic or, a, or you know, even a, like there's a group of organisms, which many of you are aware of, the generally regarded as safe, they're called grass organisms that are, um, you know, they're not approved necessarily by the FDA as, you know, most supplements are not. But they're generally regarded as safe, just like the name. They've been used in millions of people. People have taken them as, as supplements for years. And if an organism like that could be used to augment immune responses, even by a small amount, uh, that would be something that could really change the efficacy, especially in that short term when there's that explosive epidemic that's spreading rapidly. You know, a two-dose vaccine that has to come from somewhere and then be given multiple doses before, you know, it's just, it would be much more realistic to, to um, use something short-term uh, for, for augmenting immune responses or for a prophylactic in the setting of one of those situations. Uh, so that's really the ultimate goal of, of our work um, is to see how we can use the gut microbiota to do that. Um, you know, I am also interested in understanding mechanisms, but I think most importantly, it would be finding something that could be used uh, in humans. And we have other, you know, I'm part of a clinical trial of using antibiotics to prevent cholera in household contacts who are at high risk, but it would be better if we had something else. <laughs> All right, um, yeah, oh, that's interesting. Um, Dr. Rahman, uh, yeah, I think I missed this question earlier. Do you expect the suppression function of a community to be related to the phylogenetic diversity of the consortium? Maybe having more strains of a similar taxon is opt optimally suppressive. It, it's possible. I, there are people who have created, um, like some of the some of the original work in trying to create defined consortium was done by Kenya Honda a long time ago, uh, well, long ten years ago, two thousand thirteen, where he showed that a clostridial group of clostridial strains can upregulate T-Rex in the in the intestine. Um, you know, it's entirely possible that that could work. Um, one interesting result that we've seen that I didn't put on the slides is that if you take any one of our members individually and try to see if any one of them work, they, they don't. They actually all fail miserably. Um, and and like there's no difference, you know. Like I think there's there's only one member that even does a 
anything to Klebsiella pneumonia in vitro. Um, it's like half an order of magnitude. But then when you mix all 15 together, you get eight orders of magnitude suppression. So it, it indicates to me, actually, that there is some probably cooperative thing happening that's phylogenetic, that dependent on the phylogenetic diversity, not on the, not on the specific strain. But, you know, look, like we haven't, there's, there's an enormous amount of complexity to, to try to answer that question because strain level variation could be important. We would have to assay each one individually, um, of, you know, probably all of the 700 strains that we have. But to a first degree, my my gut says that um, it's probably a cooperative cooperative thing across diverse functional groups. All right, and I think just as a, as a last, uh, my understanding is you, Arjun, have a question for for Doctor uh, Doctor Weil. Uh, do you want to go ahead and ask? Uh, Maybe I, I do. The last I question. do. So, well, I actually, I, mean, I had two. I'll ask one. Um, so uh, you probably know about some of the work um, with malnutrition in Bangladesh. Um, my question to you was, could you imagine a prebiotic that may help uh, with like, let's as an alternative to a probiotic, and which I think is probably a controversial thing to ask in the sense that we don't think of therapeutic foods as the first go-to. We think of probiotics as the first go-to, but the kinds of access you get from prebiotics are immense. Um, I just wanted to get your thoughts on what, like, what mm -hmm. could there be foods that, that could help um, augment vaccine responses? Yeah, I think, um, I, I think it's a great idea. Anything we could do would be something that that's that safe would be great to, to, uh, to be able to use. I don't think it's been studied. It's definitely um, been studied, especially historically regarding preventing infection. Like people know they drink contaminated water and then they eat like a lot of chili peppers and are they protected? You know, there's even papers about like something similar uh, to that, you know, as far as killing an organism, like once it's already in your body, but for immune responses, I think there's a lot of potential there we don't know about. I mean, a lot of foods are immunogenic. A lot They have antigens that we react to. It makes a lot of sense that by altering the baseline level of, um, you know, immune activation in the mucosa, and especially, you know, oral vaccines are absorbed in the small intestine. So that's a place where this, um, this interaction between antigens from the environment and the gut are happening. And that shapes the platform that then we then put a vaccine stimulation into. So it makes a lot of sense that that would be important. Um, and diet is definitely one of the areas that is, um, is, is under investigation for why people have different vaccine responses in different cultures and countries and genetic backgrounds. Like diet is, is definitely on that list. But nothing really definitive has come out about it. And I think some of these interactions are just so complex with human genetics and different foods and the sanitation of the food. I mean, it's really hard, like studying malnutrition and the gut microbiota alone, like just dissecting all those factors is it's really a large job. I mean, these data sets in my, the microbiome world we use are huge, but in humans, the complexity is like so much more variable and, and sometimes unknown. So I think that area has a lot of potential. I, I'm a big fan of prebiotic studies as well, um, but in this field, it hasn't really been looked at extensively yet. Thanks for the question. All right, well, I think that kind of wraps up our time together. Um, I wanna thank you both profusely for uh, agreeing to be to uh, be a part of this. Um, it was really interesting. Um, happy, to, happy to have you guys uh, on board. Um, yeah, so I, I, I think now we've got a, a break until the next session um, at, uh, at 12.45. Um, uh, yeah, th thank you both. Thank you. Thank you.
Hello, everybody, uh, and welcome back. Uh, my name is Alex Carr. I'm a PhD student in the Gibbons Lab, and today I have the pleasure of uh, chairing our third and final session for today's symposium. Uh, just a note on the logistics, uh, we're going to do a slightly different format for this session. Uh, there have been some travel complications for Dr. Vincerelli, so in the interest of giving her as much time as possible, uh, we are going to um, move forward with Dr. Zekular's talk as, as planned, and then um, do a Q&A session specifically for him following his talk. Uh, and then uh, hopefully Dr. Venturelli will have had time to get set up and uh, give her presentation. Uh, there is a slight chance though that uh, she will not be able to present, uh, in which case we'll let you guys know. Uh, so with that in mind, I will go ahead and introduce Dr. Zekular. Um, Dr. Zekular is an assistant professor in the Department of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania and the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, he received his PhD from the University of Michigan, where he studied the role of the gut micro microbiota in colo colorectal cancer in the laboratory of Dr. Patrick Schloss. He then did his postdoctoral research fellowship in the laboratory of Dr. Eric Scar at Vanderbilt University Medical Center, where he studied the role of dietary metals and nutritional immunity in Clostridioides difficile infection. He started his laboratory in the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia in the summer of 2018. The Zacular Laboratory is broadly focused on understanding how interactions between the, hus the host, gut microbiota, and pathogen pathogenic microbe, uh, microbes impact human health and disease. The lab's efforts primarily center on how the important non-socomial uh, non pathogen C. difficile interacts with resistant gut microbiota during infection and how polymicrobial interactions impact growth, behavior, and virulence. Uh, his lab is also developing a novel vaccine, developing novel vaccine strategies for the prevention of C. diff infections and using microbiome-based therapies for the treatment of pediatric disease. Research in the lab draws from a number of diverse fields, including microbial ecology, bacterial pathogenesis, biochemistry, host pathogen interactions, and microbiome research. Uh, thank you very much for coming today, Dr. Zekular, and uh, go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Okay. Can you hear me okay, Alex? I can hear you, and I can see your slides. Okay, and they're, they're the right, not the presenter view, is that right? Correct. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Alex, for the um, very nice introduction and for hosting this session. Um, we, can, we can filibuster as long as possible until... Um, Ophelia gets here so that we can make sure that uh, hopefully she she's able to join us because her um, her work is just absolutely amazing and, and some of my favorite work in the space. And so I want to thank um, the organizers, um, Sean, Alex, and and the rest of the organi organizers for this really fantastic event and for for inviting me to speak. Um, uh, this is just such an important um, thing that this group is doing. You know, re you know, uh, bringing education to a really broad um, and diverse audience, and then, you know, bringing some science together too. It's just um, uh, really a model for, I think, the entire field, thinking about how we can how we can um, bring the science, you know, and bring people together to talk about these really fantastic um, questions. And the science today has just been absolutely phenomenal. Um, I do have to apologize a little bit. My, my wife and I um, just welcomed a um, newborn baby girl about three days ago. And so, I'm on uh, limited sleep. Um, you might hear baby crying in the background. And then um, I would be delighted for people to reach out if they have any questions about the talk or want to connect or collaborations. Um, but I will be going on leave as soon as I the session ends. And so um, just give me a little time to respond to you if you do send an email. So for today, I'm, I'm really excited to tell you um, a few stories um, that my lab has been doing looking at polymicrobial interactions during C. diff infection. And so um, throughout the day, we've talked about C. diff quite a bit, um, So, but I'll do a little bit of a formal introduction to C. diff here. And so this is the, um, the CDC's antibiotic resistance threat report slide for C. difficile. And so what you can see here in this, in this slide is that, um, you know, the CDC characterizes C. difficile as threat level urgent. 
And, um, you know, this high priority that the CDC is putting on C. diff is exemplified by these numbers because we see um, an incredible burden on a healthcare system from this one pathogen causing over 200 thousand um, infections every year. And these are only looking at nosocomial infections from the healthcare setting. And so um, not including really this emergence of community acquired C. diff that we've been seeing over the last decade or so. Um, we see a lot of um, mortality associated with that morbidity. And then of course the um, burden on our healthcare system is really high. So if somebody comes into the hospital with you know an unrelated complication and then gets C. diff, it can quadruple the the cost of their of their stay at the hospital. And so C. diff is of course a, a really major problem. Um, thinking from the ecology side of things, so this is a cartoon of C. diff infection. I've always been you know fascinated by C. diff mostly because it's it's a beautiful example of the. Um, power of our, our microbiome. And so under normal conditions, we're all resistant to C. diff infection, and that's conferred by um, our, our normal healthy gut microbiota and um, what's termed colonization resistance, which I think, um, you know, we, we've discussed quite a bit um, here. Arjun talked a little bit about, you know, synthetic communities and Klebsiella and kind of the strength of the microbiome and being able to preclude or um, uh, you know kick out pathogens, but but C diff is probably the best example of this because under normal conditions we're all completely resistant. And so if you go down to you know the mouse facility at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and you give those mice a billion spores of a really virulent, really lethal strain of C diff, nothing at all happens in these mice. Um, however, if you give them a broad spectrum antibiotic or an antibiotic cocktail and then give them the same dose of C diff or even a hundredfold lesser or even only a few spores, those mice will all die in a few days. And so it just really shows how important the microbiota is for um, providing this resistance to pathogens. Um, but under normal, uh, un in normal situations, when you have perturbation to this community, primarily through the main risk factor, which is antibiotic treatment, C. difficile spores, so it's a spore former, um, these spores can hang around in healthcare settings, um, can be ingested from the fecal oral route, and um, and vegetate out into the um, toxin producing cells that stay in the lumen of the gut and produce these two glucosal transferase um, toxins, which target row family GTPases and cause um, incredible damage to the epithelium and a lot of inflammation. And so, um, you know, I won't talk about it today, but the primary germinants for these spores are primary bile acids. And so um, you can think about all of the ways by which our microbiome is, you know, performing these important metabolic ta tasks in the gut and, um, you know, uh, metabolizing bile acids and keeping away the germinant will also the secondary bile acids that are um, produced by some of these, these healthy microbiota members can also be um, antimicrobial to C. diff. So, um, you know, this is the cartoon of, of C. diff infection and, and the overview of C. diff infection, but there's been a couple of things that have always motivated me in, in, in um, my lab, which is some of the clinical observations that we see with C. diff infection. So one of those is that um, C. diff infection actually falls on a pretty broad spectrum. And so when somebody is in the hospital and they get C. diff infection, um, they can manifest with, you know, really mild disease or even asymptomatic carriage. So, you know, this is much more prominent in the children's hospital with children and infants. However, um, you know, some percentage of adults will get C. diff and just carry it. Others can get mild diarrhea. And then others will get um, really, really severe complications or manifestations of this disease, like the classical pseudomembranous colitis, toxic megacolon, and even death. We don't really understand what factors um, drive somebody um, to um, have a more severe or a less severe infection in C. diff. And so that's something that motivates us trying to understand what these factors are. Additionally, there's this really, you know, interesting um, paradox in C. diff infection where, you know, what makes you susceptible to this infection is antibiotics, which perturb your healthy gut microbiota. And then what we do when you have a C. diff infection is that we treat you with antibiotics, right? And so what that does by definition is it makes you the treatment is making you susceptible to the disease and, and, and reinfection. And so we see really high rates of recurrent infections in C. diff that can be, you know, 30 to 40 percent. And then if you get a recurrent infection, the, the um, rates of getting a um, subsequent recurrence go up and up and up. And so it can be really, really debilitating where people get in these cycles of reinfection where they'll go on vancomycin to clear the C. diff. And as soon as they come off the antibiotics, they will um, get C. diff again. And so that's kind of where these um, fecal microbiota transplants have come in and kind of leveraging the strength of microbial ecology to try to treat C. diff infection. 
Um, additionally, I mentioned, you know, in, in the first slide that there's been this kind of shift in the epidemiology of C. diff in, infection where we're seeing um, uh, more and more community associated C. diff infections and in the community associated infections, there's actually, um, you know, over 50% of those, uh, those patients haven't had antibiotics in, um, in, in, you know, in the last six months or so. And so, you know, what that's saying is that there's there's likely more to the story than um, kind of the classical textbook C. diff infection or this cartoon that I'm showing and this epidemiology might be evolving. And so kind of stepping back and thinking about all of this, my lab is really motivated by trying to understand what are the factors that one, drive the spectrum of disease manifestation when you get C. diff, and then also what are the environmental microbiota and host factors that might, you know, impact this whole cycle of susceptibility and then of course disease manifestation. And so when you think about an enteric infection, so this, you know, this could be Vibrio cholera, this could be Klebsiella in the gut, this could be C. diff infection, it's really complex, right? And so we have, you know, we've touched upon just about all of these arrows so far in the symposium, but we have, um, you know, these, these complex tripartite interactions between the host, the invading pathogen, the resident gut microbiota, you know, we have um, metabolic interactions between them. They're all kind of sharing the same language, right? It's the same sandbox biochemistry um, by which they can all interact with each other. So we think metabolites are really central to this, and that's kind of what I've depicted here. But it's really complex. And trying to understand, you know, and predict what happens in a seat of infection, both in terms of the manifestation of disease, but also, you know, what the outcome of that infection might be, your susceptibility to infection, how long CDF might hang around, your risk for occurrence. It's really, really complicated. And so in my lab, we're very interested in studying all of these different arrows and kind of that complexity. And additionally, we know that this is even more complex when you think about all of the factors that are impacting the microbiota. We've had talks today thinking about pharmaceutical drugs and how they might be shaped by the microbiota and their pharmacokinetics, but also they've been shown to impact the microbiota um, directly or indirectly as well. And then, of course, diet seems to be a really important modulator of the microbiota. And so this system is really, really dynamic and complex. And so when, you, when you're trying to understand um, clinically what's happening to a patient, it can be, it can be um, quite challenging. But today I'm going to tell you about a story looking at this arrow here, um, uh, polymicrobial interactions and how the microbiota might be shaping C. diff infection. And I think the title of this session is Context Matters, right? And this is going to be a story really, really about um, uh, context dependency and in, in how who how the context by which C. diff is invading and who else is around when C. diff is there can really shape um, the outcome of that infection. And so this is beautiful work done by um, a graduate student in my lab who just recently defended his thesis, Alex Smith. And um, Alex was very interested in understanding how does the microbiota influence how C. diff, um, you know, colonizes, but ultimately how severe the, the infection could be. And one of the things that I can just mention is that, you know, similar to a healthy microbiota where we're all very different in terms of the composition of our, of our microbial communities during health, the same can be said in terms of perturbed communities. So if you look at patients with C. diff infection, there's no one, you know, perturbed or, you know, dysbiotic community that you could point to and say, aha, that's somebody that has C. diff or they're susceptible to C. diff. It's pretty diverse in terms of, um, you know, a perturbed susceptible microbiome. And so there's a lot of organisms that can be associated positively or negatively with C. diff infection. But one of the organisms that has popped up in numerous studies and been positively associated with C. diff infection are the enterococci. And so I'm showing you here just, this is just a snippet from um, Charlie Buffy's paper from um, 2015 from Eric Pamer's group, where they were looking for organisms that antagonize C. diff in a, in a way to try to identify um, you know, cocktails or, or, micro, or microbes within the microbiota that might be you know, associated with protection from C. diff. And this is where they identified um, C. syndins. Um, but you can see here that these are um, uh, on the left side of the scale are organisms that are negatively associated with C. diff infection or, you know, are associated with protection from C. diff. But additionally, they isolated and they identified that enterococci were positively associated with C. diff infection. And I'm showing you here some data from patients at, the, um, uh, at Vanderbilt as well as the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. And so these are children. Um, and you can see that patients with C. diff 
or IBD and C. diff compared to healthy controls or inpatient controls tend to have a lot more enterococcus in their guts. And so this is consistent with a lot of studies, studies that we've done at Penn, that we've done at CHOP, and of course that others have seen in the literature, that the enterococci tend to do really, really well during C. diff infection. And so um, we were interested in understanding if, if having enterococcus in your gut was positively associated with disease severity was in C. diff. And so this is just looking at um, relative abundance of the enterococci in patients at the University of Pennsylvania. And what you can see here is um, uh, on the y-axis, I've plotted maximum white blood count. And so um, this is a correlate of disease severity and inflammation in C. diff infection. And I've um, plotted here on the x-axis, um, log 10 enterococcus relative abundance. And what you can see is that there's a positive correlation where if you have more enterococci in your gut, you tend to have more severe C. diff infection. And so I'll just quickly introduce enterococcus before I get started with the story. And so enterococci are one of these classical friend or foe members of the microbiota. So they're, they're normal members of the healthy gut microbiota. So all land animals have enterococci. Um, the ones that are most important or familiar in terms of human health are enterococcus vacalis and enterococcus fecium. But of, you know, as much as they're associated with the healthy gut microbiota, they can also be really important pathogens for, for human health as well. And so you see here that um, vancomycin-resistant enterococci does show up in the CDC's antibiotic resistance threat report as a threat level serious. Um, and one of the things that's important to note is that VRE specifically um, overlaps in terms of risk factors with C. diff infection. And so things like antibiotic treatment, um, uh, length of healthcare stay or age are all associated with C. diff, um, all, all associated with VRE and uh, colonization in the gut and infection, and as well as C. diff infection. And so um, seeing these, this correlation between enterococcus and C. diff and, and the overlapping risk factors, we were interested in trying to understand do the enterococci impact C. diff infection, or is this just a you know, co association, a correlation? And so the first thing that we did was we moved to a mouse model of C. diff infection. And so in this mouse model, we use um, uh, a model that was published by Casey Terrio and Vince Young's group, um, where we use a broad spectrum cephalosporin, cefepirazone, to make mice susceptible to C. diff. And what's important to note is here on, in the black circles is that um, if you plot enterococcus abundance in the stools, enterococci are intrinsically resistant to cephalosporin, so they do really well in this model. So we have, you know, this this model where we take these mice from Jackson Labs and we give them cefepirazone, they become susceptible to C. diff, and they have a lot of enterococci. But what we can do is we can then add in vancomycin to the cefepirazone to make a cocktail, and you can deplete the commensal enterococci. So commensal enterococci are vancomycin sensitive. And you can see here that we have a way that we can nicely modulate the amount of enterococci that's in the gut of, guts of these mice by just adding vancomycin to this model. And so and what we did with this model now is we wanted to add in C. diff and see how modulating and tuning the amount of enterococcus that's in the mice impacts C. diff infection. And this is the a first piece of data that I'll show you. And what we find here, so um, in the black is the C. diff um, CFU, so the bacterial burdens after infection. And in the um, red filled in circles are the commensal enterococci. So as I said, when you treat with cefepirazone, we see plenty of commensal enterococci and C. diff colonizes early in infection just fine. However, what we noted is that when you, when you provide vancomycin and you drop the enterococci to below the level of detection, we see this delay in C. diff colonization. So the C. diff, when you gavage them, don't colonize very readily early in infection when enterococci have been depleted. And so we wanted to see if this was directly associated with that depletion of the enterococci. So what we did was we took an enterococcus faecalis strain OG1RF, which is a lab strain that we study of enterococcus faecalis here, and we added it in just prior to C. diff infection. And what we saw was quite interesting, which is that when you add back an exogenous member of the enterococci to these mice that have been depleted of enterococcus, you see that you rescue this phenotype and uh, C. difficile is able to colonize early in infection. And so this was the first piece of data that suggested that enterococcus might be supporting C. diff um, early during infection. And the, the presence of enterococci might be um, positively associated with C. diff's ability to um, colonize the gut. And so we can talk about some of the potential mechanisms with that a little bit later here. The other thing that we noticed is when we exogenously introduced the enterococcus faecalis strain to these mice, we saw that if you measured um, toxin production in the stools by looking at 
toxin titers by, um, I'm showing you here, reciprocal toxin titers per gram of stool, we noticed that exogenous introduction of that enterococci led to more toxin production in, in this infection. And so these, um, even though we were seeing similar levels of C. diff, they were more virulent. They were producing more toxin in these mice. And so in order to see if this was directly associated with enterococci, we stepped out of the mouse and we went to um, in vitro culture systems. And what we were able to do is if you grow enterococcus and C. diff together and you measure toxin production, we saw that the enterococci increased the amount of toxin that C. diff would produce in culture, similar to what we saw in the mice. But I'm actually not showing you that data here. What I'm showing you is we then moved for further and we wanted to know if this was direct contact dependent or if this it was a soluble factor. And so we took enterococci, we grew them up, and then we filtered out the cells, and we introduced the supernatants to these, um, to these uh, C. diff uh, cultures. And what we find is that even the introduction of enterococcal supernatants increases the amount of toxin that C. diff is producing. And we see this with both the OG1RF strain of Efficalus as well as the vancomycin resistant strain V583. This was not strictly um, uh, restricted to the Enterococcus faecalis. So if we went to our patients with um, C. diff infection and we isolated Enterococci, both faecalis and fecium, we find that um, you know, similar to our lab strain, both uh, faecalis as well as fecium strains from the patient significantly increase the amount of toxin that C. difficile is producing. And so just to summarize this first piece of, um, these first uh, few pieces of data, what seems to be happening is that in our mouse model, if you, um, that enterococci seems to be um, altering the environment and uh, supporting C. diff colonization early during infection, um, there seems to be some kind of crosstalk by which the enterococci are producing soluble factors that C. diff are sensing, and that leads to an increase in toxin production. And what I wasn't able to show you today because of time is that we also see that they form interspecies biofilms. And in vitro, when we model these biofilms, we're, we're unable to use vancomycin to kill C. diff. And so we think that the enterococci are providing C. diff with a, with a niche against the host mucosa and a biofilm that could lead to persistence in the face of um, the frontline antibiotic treatment that we use for C. diff. Um, additionally, in these biofilms, we think that there's robust horizontal gene transfer. So if we look at patients that are co-infected with C. diff and VRE, we see evidence of mobile genetic element transfer between the two. And I'd be happy to, to chat about that um, in, the, um, in the session afterwards. Okay, so the next question we had is, how are these two organisms talking? So clearly, C. diff is responding to enterococcus, but what is the, the language of communication? So we took two parallel approaches here, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about both of them. And so we did co-culture RNA-seq. So in our in vitro culture system, we did RNA-seq, and then we did metabolic modeling to try to predict how the enterococci were shaping how C. diff was behaving. And additionally, we did um, metabolomics and imaging mass spectrometry to try to understand um, the, this communication um, during infection. And so um, I'm showing you here just a little bit of data from this collaboration with Jason Pappin's group at the University of Virginia and a really talented postdoc that was in his lab, Matt Jenner, who I also trained with in Patch Loss's lab. And what we did was we, we did RNA-seq in the presence of enterococci, and then we did genome scale metabolic reconstruction to try to look at how enterococcus was reshaping um, C. difficile's metabolism. And unsurprisingly, what we found is that when enterococcus and C. diff are interacting, it dramatically shifts uh, C. difficile's metabolism. But surprisingly, we were able, we, what the model was telling us is that when enterococcus and C. diff are together, it actually increases the predicted sample biomass flux of C. difficile. And so this is suggesting that C. diff is more fit in the presence of enterococci, which is pretty surprising considering um, you know, a lot of the metabolic modeling that we do um, shows that, that, you know, there's some level of competition. So it seems that these two organisms, um, you know, can cooperate pretty well together in culture. If you look at um, a random forest model, what features are really driving the shift in this metabolism, what we found is that a lot of this was associated with amino acids and amino acid metabolism and specifically amino acid import. And I'll, uh, just for the interest of time, what I'm going to do is just really quickly go over seed of metabolism. So C. diff um, can perform glycolysis to make energy, but in the gut, it's been shown to really prefer sticklin fermentation, especially early on. And what, what sticklin fermentation is, is ability for um, C. difficile to ferment amino acids through both a, a oxidative and reductive um, side of the metabolism to, to make ATP. 
And so um, what we found is that when C. diff is in the presence of enterococcus, glycolysis actually, be, actually becomes completely dispensable and it relies strictly on sticklin fermentation and is predicted that the enterococci are cross-feeding C. diff amino acids. And specifically, one of the, um, as you, you might have seen with the random forest um, feature uh, selection, is that ornithine and um, downstream metabolism through proline reduction, 5-amino um, valerate was uh, the number one feature that was associated with this, as well as other fermentable amino acids like isoleucine. And so it seemed like the enterococci were providing C. diff with a rich reservoir of amino acids that it could use to grow, and that was obviously increasing its fitness in this model. But we wanted to see if we could see this during infection. And to do that, we collaborated with Boone Prentice and his grad student, Jonathan Specker, to do imaging mass spectrometry during infection. And so um, for those that aren't familiar, imaging mass spec is a way that we can take tissues and cryosection them onto charged slides and overlay a Maldi matrix. And what that allows us to do is raster a laser across the tissue. And each of these pixels that the, the laser is able to a blade gets absorbed into a mass spectrometer, and you can get a whole mass spec analysis of, you know, metabolites, for example, which I'm showing you here, or proteins, depending on how you tune the instrument, that you can then overlay back onto two dimensions and look at the distribution of those metabolites in different heat maps. You can then, of course, and we do this, um, when we do this method, you can then in parallel do LCMSMS to confirm what you're seeing. But one of the things that we saw that was um, really supportive of uh, our metabolic modeling is that during C. diff infection, we found this really, really interesting co-localization pattern. And this will kind of, kind, uh, kind of go back and remind you of Cecilia's first um, uh, talk on um, Elenta. And what we found was that um, in these tissues that are infected with C. diff here on the right, we saw high abundances of ornithine in the um, lumen of the gut. And then beautifully reciprocally localized, we saw um, arginine is completely devoid in the lumen of the gut. And you can actually see if you overlay these two, that it fits beautifully where the ornithine is really, really high, highly abundant in the lumen that you can see here in the H&E stain. And then the arginine is localized within the tissues. And this was really interesting to us because this is um, associated uh, you know, this this uh, correlation between arginine and ornithine, their reciprocal localization is indicative of arginine demination. And so the enterococci, um, similar to E. lenta, can use arginine for energy to supplement their energy needs, as well as to pr um, produce ammonia to buffer um, different environments. And so um, you can see this even with just media. And so when you grow enterococcus, it can utilize the arginine, and then it pumps out tons of ornithine. And the way that it does this specifically is through this antiporter ARC-D, where it takes in a molecule of arginine and it um, exports in a molecule of ornithine. And if you knock out this ARC-D gene, you can see that uh, enterococcus completely loses the ability to use arginine in the media. And so the next question we had thinking about this, is this directly associated with the enterococci in these mice, right? We know they have a lot of enterococcus, but we want to see if this was specific to enterococcus. And so what we did was we infected germ-free mice. And if you infect the germ-free mice with just C. diff, we now see a different story where the lumen of the gut is completely filled with arginine. However, we see no ornithine. If we add enterococcus to the mice, we now see a complete reversal of this. So the arginine is utilized and we see high levels of ornithine in the gut. And so what we think is happening is that this is largely driven by enterococcus and its ability to thrive in the C. diff gut, kind of thinking back to those first um, graphs that I showed you, the enterococcus do really, really well in the C. diff infected gut. They get to high abundances and in some cases can be 100% dominant in the microbiome. Not many organisms have the ability to do what the enterococci can do in the gut, which is just completely bloom and take over the environment. And so what we're showing here is that enterococcus has the ability through some of its metabolic pathways to completely reshape that context, thinking about context dependency by which C. diff is interacting. We know that this is driven specifically by the arginine DMNA system in enterococcus, because if you look at these germ-free mice, you see that you add enterococcus, it, it utilizes the arginine and produces ornithine. And if you knock out the arginine DMNA system or ARCD specifically, and you look back in the, into these mice that you introduce enterococcus, we no longer see enterococcus being able to remodel the environment and use the arginine and export ornithine. So we know that this is driven by the arginine DMNA system. 
But we wanted to know if this was one of the ways that uh, Enterococcus was talking to C. diff. Is this mo remodeling of the gut um, and arginine and ornithine levels what is driving that increase in toxin production? And so what we did was we went back to our system where you see you introduce wild type Enterococcus to C. diff. It produces more toxin and this is supernatants. And if you introduce an arginine deaminase mutant supernatant, you actually see that it is no longer able to increase the amount of toxin that C. diff is producing. So it does indeed seem that one of the ways that Enterococcus is talking to C. diff is through this arginine DMNA system. And if you look at the mice that were infected with an arginine DMNA mutant compared to the wild type, we actually see even in a germ-free system where the mice are very sick from C. diff infection, that there's less disease in the arginine DMNA mutant. When Enterococcus is unable to use arginine, C. diff is not as pathogenic. So the question we had was, what is the metabolic cue that's driving this enhanced virulence, right? Because the arginine DMA system is doing two things, it, or it's doing quite a few things, but it is mainly the ARCD is, is uh, utilizing arginine and then producing ornithine. So is it the arginine or ornithine that's a signal for C. diff? And even though, you know, my main model or hypothesis was cross-feeding of ornithine, we actually found that ornithine was not impacting C. diff's toxin production in our system, but instead... C. diff was responding to the lack of arginine. And so if you take, um, you know, your enterococcus supernatants again, and you provide it to C. diff, it produces more toxin. And then if you take this, um, uh, this supernatant that is making C. diff produce more toxin and you supplement back in arginine, you actually reverse that phenotype. We aren't able to do that with ornithine. When you add in ornithine, C. diff doesn't seem to produce more toxin, but it seems to be um, keenly aware of how much arginine is around and using that as a metabolic cue to regulate the amount of toxin that it's producing. Now, ornithine is not completely ignored by C. diff. Um, so ornithine can actually be used as a Sticklin product for C. diff for both the oxidative and the reductive side of Sticklin fermentation. And so what we can find is that if you take C. diff colonies and you put it next to enterococcus colonies, um, but at a distance, we find that um, it takes in the ornithine. So this is just C. diff cells in a colony. If you put enterococcus next to it, C. diff will take in all of that ornithine. And um, if you knock out the arginine DMNA system, it is unable to take in the ornithine. And then if you, we made a probe for the proline reductase, and when you introduce enterococcus to C. diff, it starts to dramatically increase its proline reductase activity. So what we think is happening is that C. diff is taking in the ornithine, metabolizing it to proline, and then reducing that proline to make energy. And so it's using that ornithine for energy. And so what we think is happening is we can kind of fill in these arrows here where enterococcus seems to be providing C. diff with a resource that it can use to grow and make ATP, which would be, um, I'm, I'm going to finish up here in just a second, well, uh, to grow, use ATP, which is increasing its fitness, but it's responding to the lack of arginine as a metabolic cue, which uh, increases its pathogenesis. So what we wanted to know is that if arginine is a signal, can we use that? and um, impact C. diff's pathogenesis. And so what we did was we um, added arginine to the drinking water. And what we find is that um, NRO, when you add arginine to C. diff, um, to C. diff infection, it actually decreases the amount of weight that's lost and the disease severity of that infection. And importantly, C. diff produces less toxin when you increase the amount of arginine that's in the system. And so this is indeed saying that it seems as though if you modulate the amount of arginine that's in the system, C. diff is less pathogenic. And so I'll just end here and just kind of um, fill in the system uh, or fill in this model. So what we think is happening is that um, enterococci are reshaping the environment by outgrowing during C. diff infection. This leads to a reshaping of the metabolic environment in that context. And, and C. diff responds to that by producing more toxin. Um, I'm not able to talk about it because I went a little bit slow, but we've been very interested in understanding what enterococcus gets out of this. And what we think is happening is that C. diff damage liberates nutrients, including arginine, but other nutrients as well that allow enterococci to thrive and kind of keep this cycle going and this increased pathogenesis. And so um, with that, I think I'm, I'm just a little bit over time, but I want to thank my lab, including Alex, who drove all of this work. We have incredible collaborators at Penn and Shop, as well as collaborators that I tried to mention as we go, Boone, Jason Pappin's group, um, Derry Van Tyne as well. Um, and with that, I'd be um, happy to kind of jump over to the question, question session. Thank you very much, Dr. Zakila. That was a wonderful presentation. 
Um, yeah, really appreciate the um, kind of ability for your research to cross these different scales, you know, going from like modeling to uh, experiment to validate the uh, mechanisms. Um, yeah, we actually have quite a few questions here for you. Um, so I'm gonna go in order of those voted. Um, so first one uh, says, on one slide, I think it was one of your first slides, looking at the associations with commensals and CDF, uh, someone noted that there seemed to be another commensal previously associated with susceptibility. Uh, they asked, have you looked beyond the entero cosi? Yeah, so there is uh, quite a few organisms that are positively associated with C. diff infection, and, and by no means are the enterococci the only ones that, you know, we think are important and that we're interested in. Um, and I think in, in the Buffy et al. study, there was a few that popped up through the study. They did a couple of different ways um, of looking at this, and one was the lactobacilli. Um, we tried to look at the lactobacilli, one, because they um, also, you know, use the arginine DMNA system. Um, but the problem with the lactobacilli is that they actually produce a lot of factors that inhibit C. diff as well. Um, and so, you know, Rob Britton's done quite a bit of work on this, um, that, you know, you kind of have to find the right strain that isn't inhibiting C. diff in another mechanism to see if it can positively associate it with C. diff in another way. But it kind of it kind of goes towards context dependency, where like, you know, the enterococci seem to really, really do well with C. diff. They seem to be positively associated in, you know, a lot of studies. And then, of course, in our mice. And then when we're studying them and trying to understand how they interact, they partition resources really well. Um, they both, you know are positively associated with the same, you know, perturbations in the gut. So they see each other quite often. And I think that they're easy to kind of study in this context, but others like the lactobacilli, it might be very strain specific. It might be biogeographically specific, thinking about where they might see each other. And so we're very interested in these kind of nuanced looks. And mm -hmm. then of course you might ask yourself like, um, I'm just filibustering until we, you know, make sure that we, that, that you know. Great. we also have a bunch of questions. So <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. Really I just, I just think it's like a really, really cool way to think about it. And we're only looking at two organisms here. And if you go back to that, that um, slide I showed, we have a lot of patients that have no enterococcus during infection. So what's going on with them, right? They could be just as severe. And so we're very interested in all of that. Yeah. Yeah. That's really interesting what you met, mentioned about the, the lactobacillus too, because as I think one of our other speakers noted, uh, those are traditionally thought of as beneficial commensals, but there's yep. spectrum uh, yep. and they're, they're not all good guys and context matters. It's all about context. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, yeah, so moving right along, a next question. Uh, yeah, I think in the very beginning you showed the mouse models and how you showed that this uh, antibiotic uh, treatment that could potentially knock out your enteropesi um, showed was like some of your first uh, results showing how they were associated with uh, C. diff infection. Uh, the question is, uh, in your antibiotic treatment, like, were other? How did the a treatment affect the other commensals, and were the other commensals present? Yeah, absolutely. And so, so those antibiotic treatments aren't like, you know, they're depleting the microbiome in terms of biomass and and. Um, uh, you know, cephalopyrazone alone even really alters the microbiota. And then the cocktail of ceph and vank is, is really dramatically perturbing the community. Um, we, we haven't looked at what other organisms are, you know, like negatively, like, you know, what the vancomycin might be knocking out that also could be associated. You know, we were, we were taking a sort of enterococcus specific, um, uh, or enterococcus centric look at this, mostly because the enterococcus are, are so clinically relevant to C. diff infection. But we've started to go back and like look at the same um, system and, and think more broadly about the community and do, you know, metagenomic sequencing and trying to understand which other organisms are associated with this. And then which metabolites are associated with this. Like why exactly are certain antibiotic cocktails uh, more or less conducive to C. diff colonization early on? And is this you know, kind of life beyond just bile acids. We think a lot about bile acids and C. diff infection because they're so important, but um, we think that this is more complicated than bile acids and likely other nutrients and, and um, uh, yeah, different factors. And 
you know, we certainly think that the enterococcus are providing fermentable amino acids, but there, you know, what else could be going on there? What other organisms might be positively or negatively associated in those antibiotic treatments? We're very interested in. That sounds that sounds great. Um, okay, so next up, uh, participant asked, could you please expand on the horizontal gene transfer result that you touched upon in the talk? Yeah, absolutely. So we, um, what we were able to do is take, because we see so often co-infections or co-colonization of VRE in the gut during C. diff infection, we were able to do analyses with Derry Van Tyne's group at the University of Pittsburgh from a cohort of patients at Pitt um, that had both of these organisms and look for um, putative metabolic uh, or putative uh, mobile genetic element transfer um, and what we find is really, really robust shuttling of, of um, antibiotic resistance genes specifically. Um, the most uh, prominent of those is um, TN916, which is a well-known transposon. We actually use it in some strains to get DNA into C. diff, and it, it, um, in, it encodes uh, its own conjugative element on it and has tetracycline resistance. And so we can actually actively see that moving between the two. Um, you know, during co-infections. Um, so a lot of the things that we found were clusters of, you know, mobile genetic elements associated with antibiotic resistance. However, um, one little bit of the story that was really, really fascinating that we're very interested in is um, we actually find that there are genes that go from, you know, enterococcus love to share um, DNA. They love to move around plasmids and, and transposons. But we actually find, um, we actually found an example of a repeated transfer of a C. diff collagen binding gene to VRE. And what was interesting is that this was a sorte sorted collagen binding um, or predicted collagen binding protein from C. diff that we were finding in VRE readily. And if you take it and you clone it into the lab strain that doesn't have this, it, it binds collagen better. And so it can sort this gene from C. diff, put it on its surface and bind collagen better and make better biofilms. And so wow. it was actually really, really cool because they're finding each other a lot in the gut because of this antibiotic treatment and the perturbation that we're giving. They grow to really high levels. And then it seems like it's not just metabolic crosstalk, but it's DNA crosstalk. And in some cases, we're finding examples of functional proteins moving between the two that might change the niche of each of these. And context, again, is you know really important there, right? So... Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah, do you think uh, just to kind of follow up on that? Do you think then that would suggest either potential or maybe some past history of coevolution of these two? Yeah. So this is um, it's really interesting to think about. Like, so it's there's there's no doubt that um, these two organisms see each other often in the healthcare setting, and there's the, you know the examples of viri fecium evolution, um, it, you know, and in specialization to the healthcare settings, right? The VRE fecium that are causing infections are really, really divergent from, you know, regular fecium. They, they, they're they very, very well suited for the hospital environment. And I find that really fascinating. So there's clearly a lot of action that can happen in a short period of time that we've been using antibiotics that these two see each other and maybe have co-evolved in that, that case. But where I think this could be more of a long-term, um, you know, co-evolution that might just manifest more recently is that these are two organisms that colonize infants very, very readily. And so enterococci are among the first organisms that colonize a baby during succession of the microbiome. And we find C. diff in you know, uh, most babies. And the question is, is that a, um, a new thing from you know, uh, uh, you know, hygiene hypothesis? Has C. diff always been in babies? It would kind of be cool to think about that. But maybe they've been co-evolving kind of early in succession of the microbiome when it's not overt disease, long before we then kind of pulled it out with antibiotic treatment, but that's, I'm kind of hand-waving there. Um, but that, that's yeah. kind of my, my answer yeah. to that. Yeah. yeah, that's really interesting. Also, yeah, you mentioned, uh, and this is a, a fact I was unfamiliar with too, the, the fact that, yeah, lots of infants tend to be uh, colonized by C. diff. Um, yeah, why do you think that is? Do you think that's something that's always been true? Is it yeah. maybe a more modern phenomena? Like, is it coming from the hospital or the mother? Yeah, yeah. So we're studying this very actively. It's so it's so weird. It's so cool and weird, right? Like these weird phenomena that everyone knows, but you can't explain. So the answer is we don't really know. But um, 
the antibiotic treated gut looks a lot like an infant gut, right? Like in terms of bile acids, in terms of, um, you know, this, the, the uh, lack of diversity, the simplicity, the, you know, you haven't, you haven't grown out. And the thing that kind of saves you, or at least we think saves you is, is, you know, um, antibodies and breastfeeding from mom and things like that. But I, but I suspect it's, it's, the antibiotic gut, the antibiotic gut is a lot like the infant gut and C. diff is just taking advantage of open niches and is a spore former. So it's kind of around, right? And so mm -hmm. that's kind of why I think it probably um, is colonizing infants so readily because it's just, it's open niches and, and there's lots of primary bile acids and it just kind of goes, goes, goes. But why, why it's acting the way it does in infants, I don't think anyone knows. Um, you know, why? like infants don't get sick from C. diff, which is you know, I have a three day old here, they get sick from everything, right? Like, um, so like, why don't they get sick from C. diff? It's, it's a mystery. That's very cool. Yeah, that's fascinating. Yeah. Uh, maybe one more question, because I looked and it looks like Ophelia was able to make it. Oh, awesome. Uh, so yeah, last question. Um, I think this connects back to uh, one of the previous talks. Uh, so you had mentioned this phenomena with arginine uh, and the ability of the enterococci to uh, metabolize it and produce ornithine for C. diff, if, if I got that correctly. That's uh, right. So the question is, do you think an organism like E. lenta maybe could be used uh, to outcompete this enterococci and ablate maybe its benefits to C. diff if it's consuming the arginine? Yeah, it's a really good question. And I think what actually is happening with E. lenta is that I would assume it's playing the same role as enterococcus, right? because it's using arginine and making ornithine and C. diff responds to that in a, um, you know, a more pathogenic way. I think what we want to do is try to identify ways to kind of break, um, uh, like to maybe compete with the ornithine, right? Like maybe you could, um, like thinking about like breaking these arrows, right? Like these context dependent interactions that are driving changes in C. diff fitness, could you compete with these different arrows in terms of, or, you know, alter that, that communication? Um, the way that, you know, we would think about it is that you could certainly try to compete uh, for the arginine, but I think it might have the same effect on C. diff. We're not sure. Maybe the way to think about it is that could you inhibit the arginine demonation or could you in compete for the ornithine? Um, you know, like these are the ways that we're thinking about it, but actually, as I talk about it, it's a really good question. I think like, um, you know, how could you ecologically break these chains is exactly what we're thinking about because our study was able to show that by altering the metabolism of another organism that isn't the pathogen, you can change the pathogen, the outcome of the infection and the pathogen's behavior. And so that gets to start, you know, you start to think about what that means. It's a cool proof of principle that targeting bystanders can change the entire chain and so like creative ways to think about that is i think what what you all out there will will be be solving in the future for sure that's great well thank you so much thank again, you Alex. and for uh all these insights um yeah so i think with that uh i will go ahead and introduce uh dr ophelia venturelli and then while i'm doing that uh dr venturelli uh once you're uh able to go ahead and share your slides. Um, okay, so yeah, Dr. Ophelia Venturelli is an associate professor in biochemistry and biomedical engineering, chemical and biological engineering, and bacter bacteriology at the UW Madison. The Venturelli lab uses systems and synthetic biology to understand and engineer microbes to address grand challenges facing society in human health, agriculture, and bioprocessing. Dr. Van Turilli began her appointment in 2016 after completing a Life Science Research Foundation Fellowship at UC Berkeley in the laboratory of Dr. Adam P. Arkin, uh, which is actually where I had the pleasure of working with uh, Dr. Van Turilli as a research associate. Um, her postdoctoral research uh, focuses, focused on new synthetic biology strategies to enhance metabolic flux and bacteria and reverse engineering interactions shaping assembly of human gut communities. She received her PhD in biochemistry and biophysics in 2013 from Caltech uh, with Richard Murray, where she studied single cell growth and gene expression dynamics and the role of feedback loops in metabolic gene regulatory networks. Uh, Dr. Venturelli has received numerous awards for her multidisciplinary research, including the Shaw Scientist Award in 2017, 
the Army Research Office Young Investigator Award, also in 2017, uh, as well as a Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation Innovation Award, the ACS Synthetic Biology Young Investigator Award, and the OVCRGE Early Career Innovator Award uh, just this last year. Uh, so yeah, with that, I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Alex. Can everyone hear me? I just want to make sure that I can hear there's you. A lot of, there's a lot of background noise. So, okay. I <laughs> Hopefully it doesn't come through. Okay. That's great. That's fantastic. Okay. Let me just, uh, okay. And you can see my slides too? Yes. They look great. Okay. Perfect. All right. So yeah, thank you so much, Alex and Sean, for the opportunity to give a talk um, on some of the work that we're doing studying the gut microbiome and the interactions that shape the system. Meta We're interested in metabolism and also in pathogens. Um, and I'm excited to tell you about some of the work today. So um, I'm sure our gut microbiome has been introduced extensively, um, but uh, there are trillions of bacteria that have co-evolved with us for a very long time, thousands of years. And um, this community uh, in a healthy state can break down dietary fibers and produce um, a myriad of different molecules and degrade molecules um, that affect our cells, our bodies, um, and also have feedback loops that affect the gut microbiome um, uh, composition and functions and metabolic activities. Um, and this is a very complex system with numerous interactions with dietary fibers and other molecules like drugs and things that we consume um, and uh, between these bi-directional interactions between the host and, and the microbiota. Um, so that is in a healthy state. Um, this community is in homeostasis. And then if there is a disruption, say as a pathogen um, is able to secure a niche, um, then the community composition and function changes substantially. And that can lead to substantial alterations in the metabolites that are being produced and degraded, which in turn has um, a profound impact on our, um, our health. And um, this can cause inflammation and there can be also feedback loops that reinforce this inflammation because um, these pathogens can actually create ecological niches that they can exploit. And that in turn creates more inflammation and disrupts the gut microbiome. And so, um, this is a very dynamic balance that can be easily disrupted um, with antibiotics, with drugs that we take, with host dysfunction, and with pathogens. And so we want to understand this dynamic system and ultimately what is driving this system or the interactions uh, between the gut bacteria and also between um, the host and, and with the environment. So, um, you know, this, this uh, meeting is focused on um, understanding interactions that affect C. difficile and its, you know, ecological niche. Um, and C. difficile has been introduced already, so I don't need to exp uh, explain a lot about it, but it's a very deleterious pathogen. And antibiotics are the first line treatment um, for C. difficile and can be effective. Um, but in some cases, a significant fraction of cases, patients can have recurrent C. difficile infection. Um, where after taking the antibiotics, C. difficile comes back um, and causes, again, this really severe infection. Um, and this can lead to death and, and severe, um, severe digestive um, colitis and, and, um, and inflammation. And if, um, one of the remarkable things is that fecal microbiota transplantation, which has been known for a long time, where we can take bacteria from healthy donors and transplant them into patients that have a C. difficile infection, this can be more effective than antibiotics in treating recurrent C. difficile infection. So here we see that gut bacteria can be used as a drug to inhibit a pathogen, which is really uh, a fascinating um, discovery. Um, and so um, this is, um, you know, kind of lays a foundation for, for the fact that, you know, microbiota, healthy microbiota can be used as a drug, but there are a lot of limitations that, prevent FMT from being kind of our future goal. Um, one of them is this transfer of antibiotic resistant pathogens um, or other unknown factors because the samples are often not characterized or standardized. Um, and there's a lack of scalability. So there can be a lot of donor variability and we can't easily personalize this for other types of pathogens or other types of diseases. You know, using FMT, we don't really know what the mechanism is and therefore we can't 
optimize it or personalize it um, uh, for different individuals with different um, uh, types of diseases beyond C. difficile. So we want to think about the next um, you know, type of treatment that we, we would like to um, uh, design and understand how to use. Um, and um, you know, replacing FMT with bacterial therapeutics that are defined, standardized, optimized could be a future goal. Um, and these bacterial therapeutics could have be as effective as FMT, if not more effective, um, and consist of known combinations of bacteria that are well characterized. Um, and this could be potentially personalized if needed to different individuals. Um, and also we can understand the mechanisms that um, by which these, um, these bacterial therapeutics work. So this is a really exciting goal and you know, something that we're working towards and, and many others are working towards as well. And, and pharma pharmaceutical companies are also working towards, but there is a challenge with navigating this enormous design landscape. So when we think about all the different bacteria that we could use to build a bacterial therapeutic, the number is enormous. So within our gut, we have about 100 species, and that would lead to 10 to the 30 possible combinations of commensal strains that we could potentially combine. Um, if we think about including this with other types of fibers or you know, um, other molecules, then this design space gets even larger. And what we, um, the way we think about this problem is a landscape um, where on the axes, we have community composition, which is the genetic features of a microbiome weighted by the abundance of different strains and how that maps to C. difficile abundance or toxin production. We think about this as a microbiome structure function landscape. And if we wanna design a bacterial therapeutic, then we wanna move the system from kind of suboptimal part of the landscape to a more optimal part of the landscape. Um, so we wanna be able to inhibit C. difficile um, with these um, bacterial therapeutics. But this landscape can be very rugged, could have had many peaks and valleys and hard to understand um, uh, and hard to predict. And we can't exhaustively explore it even with the most advanced high throughput methods. Um, and so our lab approaches this problem by combining high throughput experiments. We use liquid handling robots that are housed inside of anaerobic chambers. And we also use droplet microfluidics um, which is a technique where you can encapsulate single cells or communities into these picoliter to nanoliter emulsions um, and study about a million different um, single cells or communities in a given experiment. And we use this data to combine with computational models that range um, in the types of resolution or the types of uh, interpretability of the model to predict and design the system. Um, and we're interested in pathogens, but we're also interested in lots of other microbiome related metabolic functions um, as well. And so um, this allows us to kind of efficiently explore this um, structure function landscape. Um, and we can use techniques from Bayesian optimization, which is an, a, um, a principled way to systematically explore this landscape by balancing kind of uncertainty in our model and our objective, which is, you know, inhibiting um, C. difficile and um, in, in a like wide range of environmental contexts. So I wanted to quickly introduce um, computational modeling and highlight that there are different tools available. Um, microbiomes are a unique system. They are very um, dynamic. So capturing dynamic behavior is important. Um, and also they are um, kind of driven by in different types of interactions, could be pairwise, could be higher order. Um, so we want models that can capture the complexity of these systems. We also want models that give us biological insight out of the system. So if we think about kind of the uh, features of a model, we have flexibility uh, where the model could adapt to experimental data or interpretability where we could extract biological information out of the model. Um, and so genome scale metabolic models are, are more, more very interpretable. They have high um, kind of resolution um, and granularity. Uh, whereas the recurrent neural network or machine learning models are very flexible, but they lack that kind of mechanistic um, uh, kind of biochemical uh, basis. And so we can't easily look at the parameters of a, of a machine learning model and extract biological information, but they're highly flexible. Um, and so two models we've used very widely are the dynamic um, ecological model called the generalized Locke-Volterra. 
Um, and this model, I will kind of mention uh, frequently in the talk. And so I just wanted to point out that um, this model represents the interactions between different species in a pairwise manner. So it's um, basically how species A or species I affects species J and captures the temporal behavior of the community um, as a function of each species' growth rate and its pairwise interactions with all constituent community members. Um, and so this model can give us um, insight into how species interact. It um, lacks some flexibility because it doesn't capture higher order interactions, um, but it is very interpretable. So we can get um, uh, information about the ecological interaction network in the system. Um, so there are other models that we are working on to kind of balance some of these trade-offs and also explore and exploit new sources of information. So for example, our uh, microbiome recurrent neural network model is a physics informed neural network where we have eliminated um, the possibility of negative species concentrations or spontaneous appearance of um, different um, factors in our model, whether that's species or metabolites. Um, and this was recently published uh, in uh, PlusCon Bio. Um, and then we also are working on models where we can combine physics and machine learning and also capture the bipartite network um, that is driving microbiomes between metabolites and species. And so that's um, an ongoing kind of project in the lab. We also have um, in, uh, interest in predicting um, health relevant functions of the microbiome, such as C. diff uh, in inhibitory potential from genomic information. So we're working on that as well. Um, and those models allow us to explore um, new properties of the system and also allow us to capture the flexibility that is needed because there are so many mechanisms within microbiomes we don't know how we don't know what is actually driving uh driving them and so there's a lot of hidden dynamics so um with that i'm going to kind of dive into some um vignettes about c difficile that we've studied in the lab and um, kind of explain the role of interactions and how important those interactions can be so as I mentioned, antibiotics are a first line treatment for C. difficile. Um, two um, commonly used antibiotics are vancomycin, which is very widely used, um, and it's a cell wall inhibitor and targets primarily gram-positive bacteria. Um, and there's also a, a DNA damaging antibiotic called metronidazole, which um, is actually inactive, but converted inside the cell to a active drug. So it's a pro-drug that's activated by anaerobic bacteria into an active drug. And actually metronidazole was used and is used for other types of treatments, um, infections beyond C. difficile. But um, now I think it's um, due to some uh, interesting kind of decreases in efficacy, it's no longer kind of the recommended antibiotic. Um, but we wanted, we were kind of curious about metronidazole and why, you know, trying to understand maybe why it could be limiting. Um, uh, and so, these are two very uh, widely used antibiotics. So we were interested in understanding, could interspecies interactions, we know the C. difficile is part of a complex ecosystem, it's not alone, and so it interacts with the gut bacteria, could the interactions affect C. difficile's response to antibiotics? And so um, we know from our previous studies, and I'll talk um, a little bit about this towards the end of the talk, that gut microbes can be very inhibitory towards C. difficile. And this is um, evidenced by the efficacy of FMT um, that gut bacteria can inhibit C. difficile. So there are these gut bacteria that inhibit C. diff and these antibiotics can affect the gut bacteria. They also can affect C. diff. So how does that lead to um, the kind of community assembly dynamics that we see in response to antibiotics um, in response to these clinical, clinically relevant antibiotics? So we did um, uh, an experiment um, in vitro where we took commensal bacteria and we co-cultured these bacteria with C. diff and we exposed the communities to metronidazole or vancomycin, a wide range of concentrations. And these um, are kind of like pie charts uh, summarizing our results that for metronidazole, we found um, that in most cases there was, you know, slight maybe changes in the um, MIC of C. difficile, but they were very moderate. 
And only in a limited set of cases do we see a substantial change, which is kind of the red slice of this pie, um, in the MIC of C. diff in response to these gut bacteria. For vancomycin, we saw more kind of variation, um, but we didn't really see, um, uh, sorry, vancomycin, we didn't actually see substantial changes in MIC, but we did see that in the sub-MIC response, which might be relevant when um, antibiotics are kind of degrading in the gut or they might not reach the same concentrations in vivo um, that, uh, you know, depending on the tissue and, and where, where the local concentration of the antibiotic um, could actually be in the sub-MIC range. And so we examined the sub-MIC range as well and found that um, there was a substantial fraction of communities where C. difficile's growth was altered in the presence of certain gut bacteria when these antibiotics were present. Um, and so this showed that while MIC was mostly pretty resilient to microbial interactions, the sub-MIC response was highly sensitive to microbial interactions. Um, and to kind of highlight one of the most um, substantial effects we saw, um, so we know that gut microbes are inhibiting um, C. diff and metronazole is inhibiting uh, C. diff as well. And if we look at the dose response, we see that C. diff is killed at a certain concentration of antibiotic. But when we co-culture C. diff with a bacteria called D. piger, um, C. diff becomes essentially uh, resistant to the antibiotic. So all of a sudden, C. diff is not killed by any concentration that we tested in, in this experiment. And so this was really interesting and very unique to D. piger. There was no other bacteria that had um, this substantial effect on C. diff's antibiotic susceptibility. Um, so we were curious what the mechanism could be. Um, and there's one possibility that D. piger is just degrading the antibiotic directly, um, which we ruled out with some experiments. There is also the possibility that, um, that there is an indirect interaction where the presence of D. piger somehow renders C. difficile resistant but it's not directly interacting with metronidazole, it's doing something to C. diff. Um, and so there's one property of D. piger that we know is very notable, which is that D. piger produces hydrogen sulfide and as a consequence can sequester different metals um, in the environment. And so we were, uh, given the fact that this was D. piger was um, the only strain that had this substantial effect, we um, investigated this um, using transcriptional profiling where we co-culture either C. diff alone, sorry, co-culture C. diff with, with D. piger, or we culture C. diff alone. And what we found was that um, D. piger induces a really substantial um, metal starvation signature where certain um, iron sequestration acquisition genes are upregulated, and, um, and then there's iron sulfur cluster binding proteins that are substantially downregulated. And while the mechanism by which metronazole is converted to an active drug is not known precisely. Um, there are hypotheses that um, there are certain enzymes that are inside the cell that are performing this um, inactive drug to pro, sorry, pro drug to active drug transformation. And these genes were actually downregulated. So um, this suggested a really interesting mechanism of um, resistance in only a community context where in C. diff and monoculture, it is producing um, enzymes that can convert metronazole from this pro-drug to active drug, and there are metals present, which are required for these enzymes to function. Um, but in the presence of D. piger, D. piger sequesters these metals, and that in turn leads to a downregulation or basically lower activity of these proteins and downregulation at the transcriptional level, um, which in turn then makes C. difficile resistant to metronazole. So this was really fascinating to me um, that microbial interactions, just a simple co-culture can enable anti antimicrobial resistance um, to an uh, important antibiotic. And this might not just be limited to C. diff, this could be actually more broad to other types of bacteria that are targeted with metronidazole. So metronidazole is used pretty widely for other types of infections. Um, so I just wanted to make sure I stay on time, but I think I have um, a little bit of time left. Um, but feel free to let me know if I am going over. <laughs> um, so there was another really interesting phenomenon we found, which is in the sub-MIC range. And as I mentioned, this could also be physiologically relevant. Um, 
where in the presence of certain gut bacteria, we saw this alteration in the growth of C. diff um, in the presence of sub MIC concentrations. And this was very ubiquitous. This was not a um, rare phenomenon like the deep higher scenario. Um, and so there is a hypothesis that um, due to biotic competition, when there's, anti when there's biotic competitors that are sensitive to the antibiotic and they're inhibited by this antibiotic, that could lead to an attenuation of the competition, which in turn kind of um, has a competitive release on C. diff. So C. diff could essentially bloom in response to sub MIC concentrations. Um, and if this is true, then we would expect that the biotic competition between different gut bacteria and C. diff would display an informative relationship with the um, growth enhancements or kind of bloom of C. diff in response to the sub MIC concentration. And we actually did see this both in pairwise communities and in multi-species communities, where um, in communities that have these sensitive biotic inhibitors, they are inhibited by, by antibiotics, whether it's vancomycin or metronazole, and that can lead to this kind of bloom of C. difficile at the sub MIC level. Um, sub MIC range. So this is also very counterintuitive. It says that in the sub MIC range, you can actually have, depending on the ecological context, you could have kind of a bloom of C. diff that is unexpected. And this is just due to this competitive release phenomenon. Um, we built a computational model and um, this model was very simple. It uh, consists of a generalized lock of Volterra model that I described earlier, that has an antibiotic susceptibility term, which is bait, uh, B I times A, and A is the antibiotic concentration. And we wanted to ask whether this model, simple model that captures interspecies interactions and monospecies antibiotic susceptibility could uh, recapitulate the trends in our experimental data. And I should mention that this model is only trained on monoculture data. So it's not trained on any, um, well, actually it's trained on pairwise model, pairwise data, as, or sorry, community data as well, but not in the presence of an antibiotic. So we're really testing to see whether a model trained with information about uh, pairwise interactions and monoculture antibiotic susceptibility could predict the uh, bloom of C. diff at the sub MIC range. And we found that um, the model was actually pretty good. Um, and we had a series of null models that we tested where we shuffled parameters to see how, whether it's like, you know, kind of a random phenomenon that our model's working um, fairly well um, in, uh, um, in has a 71% accuracy in, in predicting kind of the outcome of the dynamics in response to antibiotics. Um, and uh, this was, this model kind of outperformed other null models showing that um, this really simple ecological rule could explain whether C. difficile's growth would be kind of um, enhanced in, in sub-MIC uh, concentrations in certain communities. So these are kind of two phenomena that occur, either C. difficile's MIC is substantially altered or C. difficile has these alterations in growth dynamics um, that can lead to blooms and that in turn could potentially have consequences um, on the host. So with the remaining bit of time that I have, um, I'm going to um, maybe quickly, and I just wanted to check, maybe I'll double check how much time I have left so I don't go over too much. Yeah, yeah, five, five, five minutes. yeah five. you have like five to 10 minutes. Five minutes, okay, sounds good. Yeah. Um, Even 10 minutes is fine, yeah. Oh, okay, sounds good. Um, so, um, so now we're going to like uh, a different kind of context where antibiotics are not present anymore in this system. And we want to understand how different bacterial species interact with C. difficile. And our previous work, we showed that C. difficile, it can be inhibited by um, every single uh, commensal gut bacteria. And the mechanism by which C. difficile is inhibited is through resource competition, we hypothesize anti certain antimicrobials that we don't know. These are unknown antimicrobials and also acidification of the environment, which could be potentially relevant uh, in vivo as well because pH changes a lot uh, during uh, C. difficile infection and inflammation. Um, and so the way that we studied this was using this generalized lock and Volterra model 
where we can uh, combine different um, commensal bacteria with C. difficile, and then we can use that uh, time series data um, to uh, fit to a generalized local Volterra model and extract this uh, AIJ parameter. And that's what this heat map shows. So every um, square in this heat map represents the effect of species I on species J. And we can see that C. difficile is inhibited by every single commensal bacteria. So the, the C. difficile row is all red. Um, and this is also consistent with um, a negative relationship between the initial richness of the community. So how many species we combine into the community and C. difficile's abundance after 48 hours. Um, and uh, this is kind of a negative relationship where at a certain richness, we see that C. difficile essentially cannot grow anymore. Um, there are certain low richness communities that also have low C. difficile. So it's not only that high, high richness communities can be effective, but low richness communities can also be effective. Uh, and so there's one kind of major challenge that we have um, is that C. difficile has an incredibly diverse genome. Um, it is, has extreme genetic uh, variability. And so we have a collection of strains that were isolated from pa healthy patients and also patients that were uh, diagnosed with C. difficile uh, infection. And we did whole genome sequencing on these strains and found um, that their accessory genome is uh, pretty substantial, about 2,743 um, uh, genes. And there's also a core genome, which all, all you know, C. difficile strains um, harbor. And so C. difficile has this enormous strain variability. And so we were really interested in understanding how this strain variability affects interspecies interactions um, and also um, could we identify cases where C. difficile's interactions could be um, C. C. difficile, at diverse strains of C. difficile are inhibited by certain gut communities. So we could actually design robust communities that inhibit many strains of C. Diff. Um, and so we designed actually two uh, media environments. One of them is a healthy gut media where there's a lot of competition um, and a media that we call the perturbed gut media which has nutrients that C. difficile can exploit in the inflamed gut. Um, and so we compared C. difficile's abundance and we looked at a wide range of strains. Here I'm only showing four, four different strains of C. difficile. And on the y-axis we have C. difficile's abundance and the distribution is over the different consortia that we built. Um, so we have a wide range of different communities that we built from the bottom up using our um, isolate collection. And so, um, we can see that overall C. difficile's abundance is substantially higher in this perturbed gut media than in the healthy gut media. Um, and so we were interested to know, um, you know, what, how this kind of changes interspecies interactions. So when we took the data and fit the data to a generalized local Volterra model, we found that in the healthy gut media, um, there were, uh, again, lots of negative interactions. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm de-identifying de some of these species because we're currently um, kind of submitting invention disclosures and, and working with our um, wharf on campus on this. So, um, but yeah, so anyway, we, we found basically lots of negative interactions in um, this healthy gut media as consistent with our previous study that there can be ma many negative interactions that inhibit C. diff, but in this inflamed gut or perturbed gut media, we found only one strain that had um, a really substantial negative interactions with C. difficile. And it was the only strain that could inhibit all C. difficile isolates. And I should also mention that it also inhibits toxin production for all strains. So it is a very unique um, species and a really unique interaction. And um, we also um, decided to use our computational model to guide the design of certain communities. We picked two in this case. One of them has some commensal bacteria that um, are predicted to have a weak inhibition, which is WIC. And then we also have a community that has um, this unique species um, and, um, and another species uh, that we identified. Um, and these two, we have the strong inhibitory community and the weak inhibitory community. And so we use the model to actually select these communities and we wanted to test to see whether in mice, could these communities um, protect C. difficile from, sorry, protect uh, from C. difficile challenge. And, um, sorry, actually, I think my 
animation kind of broke here. Um, and what we found actually was that um, when we take these two, this weak inhibitory community and strong inhibitory community and test it in vitro, um, the weak inhibitory community allows cetaphacil to grow to a substantial level, very high level, whereas a strong inhibitory community reduces cetaphacil's growth. And so we were, and this is across multiple strains. Um, and so we took these communities and tested them in mice. So we gavage mice with cetaphacil that have these two different communities. And we found that the strong inhibitory community can actually protect uh, mice from uh, cetaphacil challenge, whereas the weak inhibitory community all the mice died um, uh, from, from, this, um, from this pathogen. And so this was really fascinating. So we wanted to understand um, what was unique about um, our, sorry, and I think some of my animations are kind of broken here. So I'm having to, this, um, yeah. So one, one thing that's actually pretty unique about um, uh, these, these two species in particular CL2, is that it has a very high metabolic niche overlap with cetaphacil. This was unique to all the other species in our community. And um, it essentially eats almost the same nutrients as cetaphacil. So it has the highest um, carbohydrate utilization overlap. It also has strictly metabol uh, strict amino acid metabolism. And so we, um, we were interested to know what was unique about, um, about this particular species. And I'm sorry, I'm just going to have to zoom out here because for some reason it's blocking it. So we did an RNA-seq experiment where we have our, um, our species and we co-culture it with cetaphacil or we um, have cetaphacil alone. And we looked at the gene expression changes um, in co-culture. And <clears throat> we found a massive change in um, the metabolism of cetaphacil in response to the species. Um, and this was very unique. If we look at other closely related species to CL2, um, they don't have the same effect. So there's something very unique about, um, about this species that is causing a massive change in metabolism. Um, and this, um, this extent of metabolic shift was not a very specific uh, shift in specific metabolic pathways, but it was throughout metabolism. Um, and so this, um, we don't really know exactly the answer about the mechanism. Um, there's, you know, several different hypotheses, but it does seem that the substantial niche overlap that this bacteria has with C. diff is involved. Um, and there could potentially be other mechanisms that play as well. So in summary, um, I've shown that negative interactions are very sparse in environments that contained Cetaphacil preferred substrates in the inflamed gut. And we found a species that has the highest degree of niche overlap. And it is its inhibitory effect is enhanced in communities. Um, it it, it um, by itself, uh, you know, I think um, may have limitations in robustness, but when it's combined with other species, it actually can be very robust. Um, and in vitro, it can inhibit um, diverse cetaphacil strains and also toxin production and ameliorate um, cetaphacil infection in mice. And we hypothesize that there is a massive metabolic shift that is taking place that's very unique to this particular um, uh, interaction. And so with that, I um, will mention that we're doing, um, you know, we're very interested in kind of scaling up our measurements and we've been working with droplet microfluidics as a method to um, capture single cell phenotype, genotype, and also community uh, as well, and looking at interactions. And um, we've published um, a, a paper earlier this year. We have one more in revision. Um, and um, the idea is that we could eventually um, take even higher throughput measurements to study um, communities and their interactions with pathogens or other types of functions. Um, and this could allow us the ability to look at millions, tens of millions of communities simultaneously. So really excited in the future, implementing these methods to identify these um, unique communities that, have, that are, you know, anti-pathogen or have um, interesting metabolic functions. So in sum, um, I would like to thank uh, our lab, which is a really diverse group of scientists and postdocs. Um, our collaborators at UW-Madison and also outside of UW-Madison and our funding sources. And um, I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks. Uh, that was wonderful. Thank you so much for that presentation, Ophelia.
uh, yeah, we have a few questions here for you. Um, let's see, I think, yeah, I'll just go ahead in the order of the votes. Um, first question is, do you think hydrogen sulfide production in the human gut induces metal starvation more generally across the ecosystem? Is there any evidence for this effect? Yeah, that's a great question. I haven't looked into the literature, but I really should. Um, hydrogen sulfide is produced by gut bacteria. It's also produced by the host. So the contribution of hydrogen sulfide produced by gut bacteria uh, relative to the host, I'm not, you know, I'm not quite sure if it's uh, what percentage that is, but I know the host has a substantial contribution as well. Um, I would imagine that it could sequester different different metals. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, that's a great question. I'll, I'll have to look into that more and see what's known. Yeah. And then related to that, I think you mentioned this in your talk. I I think I might have missed it, but you, when you were talking about the uh, mechanism of the the ablation of the metromidazole effect, was that due to the sequestration of the metals? You think? Sorry, um, uh, I missed the beginning. Was, uh -huh. When Cedif was growing in the presence of D. Piger, you see the metro the antibiotic becomes ineffective. Do you think that's because of the hydrogen sulfide sequestering like the metals? Yes, so we did an experiment where we take media, conditioned media by D. Piger, and we actually add back the metals, and then C. difficile becomes um, sensitive to the antibiotic again. So it okay. does seem that we can rescue this effect with metal supplementation. Um, so yes, yeah, so we do think that that might that might be a major mechanism. Um, so yeah, so I think that I think that's that's our current working hypothesis. And then another one that's sort of related to that. Uh, it, it was in kind of fascinating, like when you show the um, like those MIC plots with the C. diff and D. Piger, and there was this like sort of interesting phenomena where it looks like uh, in the presence of D. Piger, C. diff actually grows better with higher concentrations of antibiotic. Um, yeah, that's a good question. I think, mm -hmm. Why is that, think. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. Um, you know, I we would have to kind of look at the cell size also under the microscope, which I we did in some experiments. I don't know if we did in that one, but like when we look at OD, it is measuring also how big the cells are. So um, you know, it's it's a bulk measurement of the of the solution. It's not really telling us like how many cells are there. Um, and yeah, that, so I don't know if that is reflected in like the number of cells that are changing or whether it's like a cell size thing. Um, yeah, that's a good, another good question. I don't know if we investigated that, um, in depth mm -hmm. and, um, it, yeah. So that, anyway, that would, that's something else that we could look into. Mm -hmm. That's a really good point. Yeah. That maybe they're just getting like longer or wider. Yes. Yeah, it is possible. Uh, okay, let's see, a couple more questions for you. Um, yeah, you, you mentioned the power of using models like GLV and neural networks, and you demonstrated in your in vitro communities how you can like use those. Uh, the question is, how applicable do you think these are to in vivo gut microbiomes? It's very hard. <laughs> um, in vivo experiments are extremely low throughput. So um, when we do mouse experiments, you know, we just have a limited set of conditions. We do get time series, but the time series is not very rich in information unless there's perturbations. So usually the community will just converge to some steady state and just stay there, you know, so it's not particularly uh, informative. Um, there, so anyway, we haven't modeled in vivo data in mice. Um, I think that, there is potential there for thinking about what kinds of experiments we could do to build informative models. And people have built models with in vivo data. It's just how much we actually trust the parameters of the model. So you certainly can do it. It's just, do we trust the parameters? Um, yeah. And it's also hard to kind of validate that. I mean, you could design experiments to test it, but yeah, it, it's a pretty involved effort. But with such limited data, it becomes challenging. So I do think that models that are more mechanistic, that have less flexibility, um, maybe it would be 
they, they would have more constraints and there wouldn't be as like, you wouldn't, you wouldn't need as much data for parametrizing those models. The limitation is that we don't necessarily know those models are representative of what's happening in vivo. Um, so I think this is an interesting area that we'll have to think a lot harder about. What we're doing these days is thinking about how to build models with in vitro or ex vivo systems where we have, you know, co-cultures of, um, of like a mini gut model. Um, which is higher throughput, and then use that to predict what happens in vivo, like design communities that are interesting and test in vivo, and then we test those in vivo. But we don't use the in vivo data as part of our modeling, which is limiting, yeah. you know? So I think that is a future direction that I need to spend some time thinking a lot more about, but it's just very challenging when you have such a limited number of conditions, especially when you're thinking about like very data hungry models, like, you know, machine learning. Um, that but maybe sense. with human data, but then there's so much variability, you know, it's like, um, we're, we're, we're exploring some things with a human data set. Um, so we'll see where that goes, but it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's challenging. Um, yeah, it'll be and, and it's important. Yeah. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how that develops. Cause I know that is sort of a controversial area where some people claim it can be done and other people have argued that like, the, like you were saying, the dynamic, you're not really seeing dynamics, you're seeing steady states. Uh, in mice, yes. I think when you have perturbations, though, you could get some more rich dynamics. Um, but it's, yeah, I think anyone can build a model with any data. <laughs> the question is, <laughs> is it a good model, right? I, I, just, yeah. I think that's the, the challenge is like, we can all go and build models with data, but if the parameters are not constrained, you know, they might not necessarily represent what's happening in reality. So it's, uh, yeah. Yes. It's like that saying, uh, all models are wrong, but some models are useful. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, also, yeah, I think we have a question here for you from Dr. Zekular. Sure. Hey, Ophelia, that was really great. Hey. I made them put me back in here just so I could ask a question because I was so excited. Yeah. Um, <laughs> one thing I just wanted to say, which I think is important is that so metronidazole isn't used in adults anymore, but it's still used in kids. And so oh, um, it's very, I think what you're doing is very important and applicable because we see a lot of recurrence in kids. There's a lot of reasons that could be, but it's certainly not um, obsolete yet. We'll see. Interesting. Yeah. Um, the other thing I was going to talk Actually, about- Actually, I have is, a question about that. Sure. Sorry. It, uh, are, is it used in kids because fidaxomycin or vancomycin have like some negative effects um, or like why, I guess, why is it you still use in kids, but not in adults? <laughs> yeah. I think that's a fundamental uh -huh. um, issue with pediatrics, right? Is that it's just, it's very behind the studies with VANC that showed that, you know, both VANC and fidaxomycin are better than metronidazole have been done in adults, but not in kids. And oh, I think I general uh -huh. pediatric medicine kind of lags behind in some of these spaces. Um, and, you know, like, is there, is there, so in high risk populations like IBD, they will use VANC because presumably metronidazole has been shown not to use, but in general, in pediatrics, metronidazole is still used quite a bit. Um, mm, interesting. Yeah, so there's, no, that... there's no, it's not like there's adverse events in VANC. They use VANC, you know, for other reasons in kids. Um, okay. Mm -hmm. But I don't know, just like ammunition. That's too. very interesting. Yeah, <laughs> I didn't know that. Um, so I think about metals a lot with, um, with, with just bugs and C. diff in general. And um, the hydrogen sulfide story, I think, is interesting because I would imagine that hydrogen sulfide is actually a really minor player in metal starvation compared to just battle for metals with high affinity import systems and sedarophores and things like that. So do you think that there might be two things happening here? There's like a competition for metals and starvation that could be playing an important role. And then also a hydrogen sulfide role that could be separate and also overlapping. Did you look at other... Like does does um what is it the delta sub sulfa deep tiger deep tiger does it have um does it dedicate a lot of its genome to metal uptake is there like anything mm, that's such a good question and also I mean these are questions that are so great I hope I remember them um yeah I mean I I I don't think we looked at like siderophores in deep tiger um we automatically thought of hydrogen sulfide because it's so. Yeah salient you know what what in in vitro in vivo you know we haven't tested any of this in vivo so i think that'd be really interesting um but yeah I, so that's a great question i don't know if d piger is producing siderophores or other types of you know metal sequestration mechanisms that could also be affecting this process uh, and it's not just hydrogen sulfide and also in the gut maybe that's yeah. 
also really important too to consider you know like how that's affecting antibiotic susceptibility yeah to, think, um, to go back to the name of the session like context matters it, it it very well could be the crux of what makes you susceptible or or you know like the effect of metronidazole um being you know a clearing infection or or you know relapse or you know um like a non-responder right it's very cool yeah that's so fascinating yeah that's really interesting we will have to look into that yeah we haven't tested this in vivo i'm very interested but it's uh tricky <laughs> so um yeah oh yeah so yeah. but uh fantastic Th thank you yeah thanks awesome well thank you both so much for your presentations and uh yeah it was an honor to have you both uh here and now we'll have some closing remarks from Sean. Great, thank you so much. See ya. All right. Um, wow, what a great day of talks. Um, you know, I think you can all see how they were all related to this theme of, of our commensal microbiota as a, as a shield, as another wing of our immune system, and how we respond to pathobionts or pathogens. Um, and I think all the speakers really attacked this question from really different angles, different approaches, different experimental models and theoretical models. Um, anyway, very, very thought provoking for me. I had a great time. Um, so uh, I guess uh, before we head off here, I want to um, thank again our, our sponsors who made all this possible, um, Applied Microbiology International, Illumina, the Babylon, uh, and the UW Embrace Center. Uh, thanks so much for making this uh, a free event for, for everyone all around the world. Um, I really want to thank our uh, chairs and our speakers today. So I'll just call everybody out again. In that first session, it was chaired by Dr. Christian Diener. Um, and our speakers were uh, Cecilia Naker and Lisa Meyer. In the second session, uh, we had the, uh, it was chaired by Carl Geiser uh, with Drs. Arjun Rahman and Anna Weil as our speakers. Uh, and then you all just heard recently here from Alex as our chair uh, and uh, Dr. Joseph Zakular and Dr. Ophelia Venturelli uh, as our last two speakers. Um, thank you so much to all those folks for making today such an such a intellectually vibrant experience. Um, I'd also like to thank all of the TAs and folks involved over the last few days for getting the course to you all, and in particular our instructors, uh, Nick Quinn Bowman and Alex Carr. Um, our guest speaker on the first day was Catherine Ramos Sarmiento. Our teaching assistants were uh, Christian Diener, Alyssa Easton, Chloe Herman, uh, Noah Rappaport, and myself. Uh, and we had admin support from Dominic Lewis, who was a coordinator of this entire event, uh, kind of behind the scenes, making sure everything was working. Uh, in addition to Allison Kudla, Joe Meister, Audrey Hubbard, uh, Connor Kelly, Victoria Uhl, Shanna Braga, and Thea Swanson. Um, we couldn't have done any of this with, without the help from all those folks. Um, as a nonprofit research organization, ISB, we rely on support from donors. So if you like the educational and programming events that we've been providing for this past week, and you want to throw us a few bucks to help us out for next year, um, there's a donate link at the bottom of our website. Um, I want to um, highlight that we have an event coming up, uh, I believe next week, um, a research round table, which is a sort of public science engagement talk series that ISB puts out um, that you're all invited to. It's, it's free to register. Um, and uh, it's on Thursday, October 19th at noon Pacific time. Uh, ISB Professor Dr. Nitin Baliga and Senior Research Scientist Dr. Eliza Peterson will talk about their recently published discovery of how the tuberculosis causing pathogen evades detection and how we might exploit this finding to better find a way to treat the world's most deadly infectious disease. Um, you can register for free again uh, at isbscience.org slash events. All right. Um, if you want to learn more about ISB itself, I just told you the website, it's right over here. Um, if you want to share your experiences and your thoughts about these events and courses over the past couple of days, um, the hash is ISB micro 23 on social media and ISB's uh, handle on X is ISBSCI or ISBSci. 
Thank you again to everyone from all across the planet who joined us over these past few days. Um, we only do this because of you, because we get so much great feedback and engagement from the, the, the community, essentially. Um, and yeah, I hope you have a great rest of your year, and uh, we hope to see you again soon.